Hello and howdy to all my good friends out there. It's the fun sign. <laughs> it's good times. We're here for Gemini Herbs. I think you guys know what it is at this point, but the crew is assembled, including we got zero on screen there. Gabriel, very good. <laughs> I've never felt better in my life. I am definitely glowing as we get into June. Super, super fun uh, to be here with Michelle, Mario, Gabriel, Kyle. You guys are awesome. And thank you, everyone, in the chat. I see Matt and Artist Seer, Family Fungi, MS, and Liam, Flat Earth Hippie, Diamonds. All oh, a lot of good people. If I missed your name, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're all very welcome to be here. And right, so this series has just been a real gem of a podcast, uh, you know, playlist for everyone out there and myself included. I've been learning so much and I can't wait to get into it again with the crew. First of all, though, I think we should maybe talk about uh, Kyle and Michelle's little rendezvous. How's how's it going, you guys? What's up? Yeah, we got and Mario was there. We all got together. Michelle and Mario came back to Wisconsin, a place Michelle used to call home. We spent the yeah, afternoon yeah. together the other day. It was awesome. It was, it was like, it was just, it was so cool. We just hit the ground running like, uh, like you would <laughs> after all this practice with Vibrant. We just spent five hours just like getting in deep flow state. <laughs> it's like time to land the plane. We're like, no, let's just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, it was so awesome. And as Mario and I were talking about it, like it just, um, it was like a seamless hello, how's it going? And right into everything. And it felt as though, I mean, obviously we've had conversations online, but you know, sometimes you there's like a feeling out process of having conversation with people, especially in person. And it didn't feel like that at all. It was just like, boom. Let's go. This is awesome. <laughs> so it was great. And it was lovely to be back home for me. Lots of family time. My brother got married. So there was um, ups and downs of emotions. But uh, all in all, wonderful. Very wonderful. Yeah, man. I really enjoyed myself. Thanks for having us. It was great to meet your family and see your place and everything else and get to learn more about your history. There's things that uh, I wasn't aware of that you divulged. Uh, really cool stuff, <laughs> you know. Um, and just all around, man, I just had a great time. So cannot say enough good things about this guy. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. And hopefully all of us at some point can get together. Yeah, next time I'll get a, a, a bigger umbrella. There was only enough room in the shade for me and Mario. <laughs> <laughs> I did shoot. I chose to stay in the sun, though, that's you know, right. so it's like, you know, that's on me. And uh, it felt it felt good. By the end of the day, though, I, I was feeling it a little bit. But, you know, it's all good. You got to get the, you got to, like, uh, get it in when you can. That Definitely. sounds awesome. I look forward to my uh, divulging. <laughs> <laughs> right absolutely divulging i love that word yeah I, I i look forward to playing uh scrabble with kyle and his wife serena one thing you don't know about kyle as much if you just see him on the podcast is his wife is as knowledgeable and cool and hilarious as him so i'm sure you guys had a lot of fun all hanging out together kind of jealous but you know i had my turn earlier in the year so i guess it's only fair She's way smarter and funnier. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we, what, what else is there maybe to announce? Is there possibly new stuff cooking for anybody's channels or, or businesses? Maybe Michelle's got some, her full moon offerings to talk about for this current month. I know oh. we just passed the full moon, but maybe yeah. there's some left of whatever you batched up. Plus Thanks, Kyle's, Kyle's show too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've got soap. I sold out of all the shampoo, but I still have calendula salt soap available and mugwort earth hag soap for anyone who's interested. Um, yeah, this the soap tends to go quick. So I only have a couple of each of those bars of soap left. Um, so you guys can uh, email me Michelle's Healing Home at gmail.com if you want to order any of those soaps and uh, 
You can also go to my website, michelleshealinghome.com to sign up to the newsletter. And then you can just find out what my offerings are each month uh, on the full moon. So always excited to share that every month. So uh, thanks for the chance to shout it out to the, the crew here. <laughs> And I am also appalled at Gabriel's not just wearing sleeves, but full long sleeves. Unbelievable. Michelle knew the uniform dress code. <laughs> <laughs> Five brand is a sleeveless show. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. When the weather uh, gives us the weather that we're having now, got to go sleeveless, you know? <laughs> totally. Around here, especially. Yeah. I got some good sunshine in today. So Gemini, though, should we maybe get underway? I think that's okay. Oh, Kyle's show, though. Are you talking about Root Radical or his recent Crow podcast? Crow. The Crow show. That was great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the, if you want to get to the placenta part, that's around one hour, 15 minutes in. So you got to go for the second hour subscription. But the whole thing is great from the beginning to end. Kyle has disappeared temporarily, but uh, that... Uh, is a recent episode on Crow Triple Seven podcast, which he's been on quite a few times. Uh, he said he's got a lag, but he'll probably be back around. So we'll promote that for him. Check out Crow Triple Seven recent episode with Kyle Tip Canoe Herbs. It's a great overview of the stuff that we get into in depth and specificity in this series. So a good way to, you know, improve your your knowledge and rhetoric on the whole thing. Andy uh, Logan, Logan says his pops is in the ICU. He's got to catch this later. Good vibes to you, Logan. A little collective moment of prayer. Um, you yeah. know, there's a couple of things that actually seem appropriate to make a, a community-oriented moment of uh, uh, witness and prayer and of good, uh, good intention. So, Logan, we wish the best for you and your father and your family. Sending the good vibes. Everybody in the sound of within the sound of my voice is hearing that and affirming that that all will be as it is meant to be, as it always is. And the same for you and your family, Stacy. I heard about the, the accident that occurred for one of your family members. We love you. We're thinking of you. And everybody's holding the line of trust and faith that everything is going to go exactly the way it should. And that all is for the greater good. So... <laughs> So that that aside, I, I just wanted to make sure and pop that out. But yeah, uh, Gemini. Gemini is the fun sign. But why is that? Why do you guys think that is? It's mutable. It's air. It's a good impersonator. Fits in. Hangs out with Taurus. Hangs out with Cancer. It's in the height of the sun. Uh, who wouldn't want to have a, a Gemini birthday party? <laughs> or go to one? <laughs> Mercury, its association and relationship with Mercury, I think, is a big part of that as well. Being mercurial, obviously, being uh, something of a uh, shapeshifter. And so there's that polarity. So it's the whole spectrum of the positive and the negative, the black and the white, masculine, feminine, all of that stuff. So I think that definitely uh, plays a part in all of that. But yeah, I think the time of year, absolutely, um, you know, something to consider for sure. And, uh, you know, I think too, just the fact that uh, Mercury, I just, I, I see it so, I, it's just so prevalent all over the place. And so I feel like uh, Mercury is just kind of where it's at. And uh, I feel like for me personally, Mercury has just been such a phenomenal planet and, um, you know, God to research and everything else. Just the further along I go in my symbolic journey, the more importance Mercury kind of, um, receives and i'm just kind of i just acknowledge just and it's the day of mercury today right wednesday and so just to me uh just the legend of mercury gets grander and grander and grander <laughs> the more i research symbolism that's just the my legend takes. of mercury i like yeah. that the legend of mercury it is uh pretty massive because it's so all-encompassing it actually reaches in and touches a lot of mythoses that might not call the figure the same thing but eventually you know, when we boil it down, we're talking about the the spark between the poles, the that which travels across the threshold, the you know, the the thief and the the giver, the savior. It's all kinds of archetypes rolled into one. And I do love the mutability of our Gemini fam. The other heavily mercurial sign being Virgo, 
they can also have a, a rigidity to them in a sense uh, in like they're, they're maybe not always they're fun, but, you know, maybe like more of a dark humor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not that Jim and I can't do that, but I, I think this time of year, as we cross the threshold into the end of spring, height of summer, or you know, top of summer, it's really cool. Everybody's just loving life and excited about it. Um, so I'm gonna pull up the slides. Actually, we'll look at the the lovers' cards from the Thoth Tarot and the classic writer way. And man. I don't think I've given enough of a look at the lover's card in the thought deck. This thing is always surprising me with the levels and layers going on. <laughs> Let's get right. into it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I just, you know, noticed right off the bat is the, um, the fact that, and it's just because it's been on my mind, but notice that there's swords, you know, in the background in the uh, upper portion of the card. Uh, this corresponds with the Hebrew letter Zane, which means sword. And so uh, sword symbolism I've been getting into lately on uh, my Instagram. And the sword has the ability to cut and sever and pierce. And so it has the ability to separate, right? And so this idea of separation um, is really, really important. So it's just as important as connection, you know, or togetherness or, uh, you know, something that's holistic and unifying. And so there can't be, you know, um, things coming together. There can't be a marriage, whether it's literal or alchemical, even literal marriages, I think are alchemical marriages as well, but we can't have togetherness without this separation. And so the sword is the tool that does that symbolically, you know? And so um, the fact that it corresponds with air as well, I think is really interesting because based on the mathematical um, properties, the mathematical functions, excuse me. So the four basic mathematical functions, I associate division with air. And so we're dealing with Gemini, which is the two. And so the two comes from the one. It's the one divided. It's the one that has split. And so that splitting can reunite. Um, and so that's what this card is really all about. It's about separation and connection, essentially, is what I kind of think of. And so you're generally going to see the lover's card with three main figures. You're going to see kind of a uh, what looks like a bride and a groom, especially in older decks. These two actually kind of deviate a little bit from traditional decks because oftentimes you will see the third figure amongst the couple, not above, but amongst them. And it's actually really hard to tell who is with who or like what is really going on. Sometimes the third figure looks almost like a third lover. Um, sometimes it looks like a priest. Oftentimes their hands are kind of all over each other. Their arms are kind of all over each other. It kind of makes it difficult to make heads or tails of uh, who's actually uh, with each other or what the dynamic of the relationship is. But nonetheless, you will see obviously a third main figure here in the Crowley deck. Um, it's been said that that figure is actually supposed to be emblematic of the hermit. And he kind of looks hermetic. He has that hood, right? Um, and then in the Rider Waite deck, some people have said that it's, uh, you know, a number of different angels, but also people have said Lucifer, which I think is kind of intriguing. Um, for a few different reasons, but it's this u uniting of the uh, of the polarities of the masculine and the feminine, right? And so um, one splits off into two, two creates three, and so it makes sense that there would be this third party. Um, and then, uh, you know, I feel like pff, there's so many different, you know, things that we could talk about from here. But um, one of the fun things I was thinking about lately is the fact that the hands of the third figure in the Crowley deck, it almost looks like a Mobius strip. It looks like there's a Mobius strip around the hands of uh, this yeah. guy that's uniting these two figures, right? Yeah. And so I think that's design and intentional. Go ahead. It's, it's kind of like in a puppet, a puppet master's position, right? Right. His, hand, right. his hands are puppet, like in a puppet position over them. Yep. You, yep. You know, Mario, I often think about the, the swords, they make a corridor behind the puppet master. Mm. And uh, I, I love how everybody knows that words are swords. 
but swords are doors also. And so the swords make a corridor of doors uh, behind the puppet master in that one. So I just thought I would share those thoughts. I really like the swords as words. The whole div divisive nature of words might not seem readily apparent, but th it's very important for when you say, Ine to baño aquí y ine to baño adó. Is the bathroom here or is it there? <laughs> you know, like it gives you this ability to distinguish one thing from another that is possibly what gives humanity the imaginative capacity that we do. Because to imagine and to create, it's as much about separation and the removal, thinking like taking off the chunks of rock to reveal the sculpture underneath, as much as it is additive, like in the case of painting. You know, both are part of the equation. And then if I had to name the figure in the lover's card that is between the two, I think it is Eros. I mean, it is obviously Eros in the uh, the Thoth deck, right? That's Cupid. It's the same thing. It's the HRS or EROS or any of the many versions of that type of phonetic referring to that's the spark between the poles. That's the attractive force that brings the male generative principle and the female gener generative principle together, but also has to separate them so that there is space for that attraction to create the spark. You know, if, if the, the sky and the earth are mushed together, there's no space for life to appear in between. So in many ways, we are all representative of that figure. You know, even as a savior motif, I was thinking about it just today, how the son or the daughter, the baby that comes from mother and father is in so many ways the savior. Obviously, life continues forward into the realm because we have attraction between male and female that then causes re reproduction. But then like in your personal life, <laughs> how many people that you've seen or that if you've had kids that they didn't matter how ready they thought they were or they weren't, they just level up a bunch because that is what is necessary and required. So I think there is so much teaching that comes from this part of the sky clock about how like new life is really starting to spring up. There may even be first fruits of what you've sown earlier in the year, depending on your bio region and your skill as a gardener and maybe what you've got at your disposal. But uh, yeah, there's, it's uh it's very exciting literally it's the exci it's the excitement it's the spark you know what i mean so uh gabe to your point the whole thing about uh doorway and gateway symbolism is obviously super important with gemini uh right given the fact of the two pillars always representing some sort of doorway or middle way and everything else the two figures you know when any two people come together what i've always said is that there's some sort of spark that is created between them i've also talked about how um there is a i believe it's uh the aztecs or the mayans didn't see twins in the sky they saw fire sticks and so it's implied that these sticks are rubbed together right that there's some sort of friction between these two entities or these two energies the two parts of the constellation of gemini you know, um, and so, yeah, so middle way symbolism, doorway symbolism, third pillar symbolism or first pillar symbolism, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, very, very appropriate with everything that's going on here, for sure. Um, you know, to so, add to that weave, please. you hear of all the deities with the name Coatl at the end. And there are claims that that word Coatl as like a termination can mean serpent twin or gem as in like a gemstone i find that kind of an interesting syncretic you know wink wink nudge nudge if uh, if that's accurate and then the sumerians they had the twin mountains as gemini in terms of what the constellation represented nice that's beautiful i know um i mean it just reminds me of the fact that the babylonians their version of the twins were uh the great twins and they were armed and they uh, carried a, a hatchet and then the other one carried, I think, a sickle of some sort. But they were very, very large, hence the great twins. 
And so I've noticed the symbolism with these twins being really big, <laughs> really gigantic, you know, um, which I think is interesting because it makes sense given the fact that we're talking about polarity, you know, the negative and the positive. So obviously this concept or this idea plays a huge, huge role in everything that goes on here. And so uh, things would cease to exist without this polarity, you know? Um, so I think the great twin sort of thing or these great mountains or whatever, um, I think makes a lot of sense. One of the things I wanted to mention, um, just notice how large the sun is, right? Behind this angel on the Rider Waite deck. And it reminds me of the sun card a little bit that way because a lot of traditional decks, the sun card actually had two children in front of a brick wall. And so to me, these are the Gemini twins. And so I've talked about this before, but there's a huge relationship with hero twins, hero twin um, mythology relating to um, them being the first, um, the founders essentially of different cities around the world. And that they were the creators of the first wall as well, like in Rome, Romulus and Remus, you know. And so to me, when you see the old sun card and there's the big sun and then there's the brick wall and then there's, you know, two children in front of it, you're actually talking about the Gemini twins, essentially. So there is this, you know, relationship that's been built up for good reason with the sun and with Gemini. Um, it's very potent and it has to do with the fact with uh, its placement in the year, right? So the fact that um, it's right before, you know, uh, the official, you know, beginning of summer, if you're looking at things tropically, mm -hmm. I suppose. But uh, if you believe in procession, then um, it would have been at one point, I think, the beginning of summer itself. And then also back to this brick thing, apparently uh, the Babylonians referred to Gemini season as the brick mold because this is when they started baking bricks out in the sun. And so they would resume building projects and things like that, you know, during this time of year and everything else. So I think that's all very curious, but there is a very strong relationship with just solar symbolism and Gemini. Absolutely as well. And, and polar symbolism too, as we we're kind of already talking about. Mm, yeah. And a word for Gemini, you know, the, the bricks being generated, we have generation, but gem gemating is a word as well about, how you know things producing uh and so you know that's part of the weave as well um guys kyle M uh, michelle you guys or or gabe you want to chime in anything else on on gemini before we kind of get into well, let's go ahead into some of the air ideas but please feel free to talk more gemini stuff too well for me with gemini um one of the things that always comes up is um indecisiveness and that's kind of one of the more um I, I don't even think that's a darker side of it but the opposite side more maybe more of the quote-unquote negative um, quality of it um but on the flip side of indecisiveness you have the um ability that gemini brings to a person to see both sides of a situation and so for me that's kind of where my mind always goes with gemini because they're usually quick on their feet quick to think um, and so they might change their minds more quickly. Um, or if you're having a hard time making a decision, Gemini could actually be a good sign to even invoke or kind of focus on um, because it could help you actually maybe bring the decisiveness to something um, that you might be, you know, struggling with. So that's where my mind goes when I think of Gemini. I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of how the air sign, air signs in general, have a strong relationship with the nervous system. So we might have a lot of nervous Geminis, but not, not, uh, but also like Gemini is, so we have anatomically, you have your Aries, you have your Taurus, and the first splits that happen is the splits that happen right here in the bronchial tube. So there's this transmutation between uh, you know, as above, so below, but certainly as within, inspiring in spirit, bringing that spirit in, transmuting that spirit to move, circulate all throughout your body, all throughout your nervous system, and then expiring that spirit outwards to share it with others through your voice, through social communication. So the, the people that I know that are like the, my most archetypical Gemini friends 
are the people that can busk on a sidewalk and know every single song and do every impression of every artist. And they're very funny and, um, and witty, but there's also, like Michelle said, there's like the, 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 the little angel on one shoulder that's like, say it, say it. And the other one on the other shoulder that might be like, man, you fucked that up. You shouldn't have said that. You should, you shouldn't have played it in that key or whatever. <laughs> like that was too much. And so there's definitely like a polarity that happens. And I, so one of the things that I think about with Gemini is remedies of like bridging that gap, bringing that air uh, elements down a little bit more into the body, bringing that, that spirit, letting that transmutation really occur and bringing it all throughout the body and letting that, that expiration of the spirit, that Holy Spirit through the body uh, be very inspiring to other people and not have, not be seated with any doubt. And that's what the, the herbs of Gemini that I've kind of thought of tonight would, are suitable for. And also the lungs, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I guess I should just throw some of the 180 degree ingredients on the table too. Like if we're in Gemini, we got to uh, mention Sagittarius uh, across the Zodiac on the other side of the table. Uh, you know, the minor deacons in Gemini are Lepus the bunny rabbit and then the uh, the two dogs, Canis Major and Canis Minor, uh, in, in the way some people map it out. Uh, so those are kind of important, but that bunny rabbit is always important because of the springtime. You know, uh, bunny rabbits are, you know, signs of fertility uh but this year in particular because it's you know the year of the rabbit as well so we're kind of uh doubling up on the on the bunny aspect uh so yeah i just thought i'd throw the uh two canis you know the canis major and minor it's almost like the dogs are twinning in their own way you know uh but they're they're in gemini uh uh, right there around Orion, the, the great hero in the sky. So yeah, I thought I'd throw all those on the table before we start our adventure. Nice. I love it. Uh, one thing I'll mention real quick regarding the Sagittarius connection is that um, the Milky Way actually passes through Sagittarius and Gemini. And sometimes in, um, you know, sky maps, illustrated sky maps, of uh, the constellations, you will see Sagittarius pointing his arrow along the arc of the Milky Way. And then you will see the Gemini twins and their feet are dangling in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way for a long time has been looked at as a river. And so there are several myths that encode river symbolism with hero twins. And so sometimes it's like uh, the twins that are, um, you know, symbolic of Gemini and they're basically being held in like a blue fabric or something like that. It's symbolic of the, the river of heaven, which would be the Milky Way. And so I think it's really interesting that you see their feet dangling, you know, right there in the Milky Way galaxy. So if you ever look at any sky map, like take a look at Gemini and look at their feet, you know. So they're literally walking on water. That's one of the symbols that they're associated with as well. And it has to do, I think, uh, with that relationship. Oh, I cool! Give In that, to, I want to give a shout out to uh, James and Elise because they are super fun. And James is a Sagittarius, and Elise is a Gemini. So I just want to get a, <laughs> Ooh, gotta, nice! They are there. super fun. We yeah, were just great. looking at the letter they sent us uh, as a wedding present, and it was very kind. They sent us a bunch of seeds too, like tons of different seeds. Appreciate you guys very much. Now, on the astro theology side. You know, it comes to mind is the story of the Israel, children of Israel escaping from Egypt, being led out of Egypt. And the part where the horse and their riders being tossed in the sea, that's basically Sagittarius setting as, you know, the other side of the sky clock is rising. I think Sagittarius being the horse and the rider being thrown into the sea. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Speaking of just real and, quick, and the children well. of Israel being Gemini, in case that wasn't obvious, because it's you know the the children. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes so much sense, dude. Um, because mm -hmm. twin pillar symbolism obviously is all over the Jewish world, and then I also associate uh, a lot of 
Gemini lover's card symbolism with uh, Judaism as well. So it's the sixth card, right, of the major arcana. And then even just look at the Star of David and it's six points. I think that's kind of curious. Um, and then I see, you know, the uh, the twin pillars within the Torah scrolls, obviously the uh, the pillars in front of Solomon's temple or at Jewish synagogues, you know, things like that. And so it's actually, once you start looking into it, there's a lot to unpack and decode with all of that. But I, I do see that relationship. Lover's card being the sixth card, uh, Jewish symbolism, there's like a million different connections I see. You know, one other one that uh, I'm looking at, Mario, just recently has been um, the periodic table with the tarot. And, I, and there's so much more to say behind that. <laughs> but number six would be carbon. And so that bonding, that aspect of embrace, you know, these brothers in arms, you know, the Gemini, their, their constellation is literally like, you know, arm in arm. Uh, but even that aspect of the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, all these things, brass, uh, and uh, how bricks are literally uh, conjoined, um, all those things are kind of uniformly encoded in the Gemini symbolism. Exactly. Bricks being building blocks, and I kind of look at polarity as being the same sort of thing. It's like you can't do anything without this idea of black and white, positive, negative, etc. And, you know, for anyone's bingo card, we got to say that Gemini and Placenta are an important connection as well. And I don't know if any of that came to mind in the preparation from our herbalist masters tonight that possibly some, you know, <laughs> placenta similarities or signatures could be part of the equation because I see in the twin sense, all of us do have that twin that we're born with. And, you know, we, of course, we've talked about that quite at length, but I think it's uh, definitely an important element here, you know, especially that one, you know, in so many of the mythoses of the brothers or the twins, one of them survives and the other one is killed off in some way. And that's kind of like our placenta as well. It physically has to die for us to enter the world, but it's the it came in with us as well. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like one of the more important things I've learned about Gemini over the years is, uh, yeah, the relationship with our invisible self, our, uh, you know, spiritual double. And so the relationship you have with self is like the greatest one you need to foster and take care of and everything else. And so uh, the Egyptians refer to it as the Ka. And the Ka symbol is actually, it's a person with their arms upright like this. And so reminds me of the Twin Pillars, <laughs> reminds me of the Gemini glyph. So I think that's really, really interesting that that's the case. So to give ourselves a bit of a review on air, you guys might want to screenshot this great slide that Mario has provided to us uh, from his elemental study sheet, which you can find at his website in a pay what uh, you feel it's worth type of scenario. You can actually get this and download it. Now we have so many characters that can relate to the air element mythologically, but for sure all of them have this mercurial aspect to them and they're all listed there in the bottom right hermes thoth odin cupid janus interesting yeah janus is two-faced uh ganymede shu prometheus nut iris Maat, castor and pollux so many hero twins and twin gods out there as well um i like also that <laughs> your elemental study packet has some plants that pertain to the air as well um anything we want to mention about air as an element in general uh here guys i think we can just maybe move forward into some plants because we've talked a lot about air generally speaking as we've been in here other than to say maybe you know remind everyone of that philological link between wind which is air and mind the wm flipping upside down giving you which is a thing in sanskrit to latin the W and the M actually do interchange. So we have uh, good reasons 
<laughs> to pick that particular lock. Also, I love how, uh, like, the hair on the back of your neck is kind of like your psychic abilities, your ability to, you know, foresee what's coming. Uh, and that's kind of the Gemini scout a psychic aspect coming through. That's my favorite air element of, of Mercury. You know, another thing about what thought. Else in your arms, too. Two Gemini things, your arms and the back of your neck, right? <laughs> yeah, or even on your legs. I mean, but definitely in those places where we got the duel going on. Uh, one thing that has been fun for me since Gemini season kicked off is how many tunings that have incorporated the lover's card just kind of coming out <laughs> and saying hello. And I, in particular noticed that there's like a thematic thing that goes on as the tropical seasons progress. And now that I have a couple of years of seeing what happens in a certain tropical season in Gemini, there is a lot of emphasis on thought, you know, and that does actually come up. And for example, a client from last week, we addressed some, although <laughs> she, she didn't tell me up front, but like the, the whole OCD or like obsessive thoughts, uh, I have to do this or things won't be okay or I won't be safe. And that sort of loop that can run, that's definitely uh, something that can kind of constrict, you know, that's a, a way that the air element can kind of divide you or separate you from the world in the weird ways of routine routine thinking patterns becoming you know th like so thought and, and so swords right how our neural pathways of our actual physical gray matter can almost become entrenched by the repetition of certain type of thinking and how that certain type of thinking can put a boundary between us and our experience of reality because it's almost like this filter that's put overlaid to what's actually there where all we see is the repetitive thought pattern so but anyway in this case the i, I received an email just i think today or yesterday about the ocd is gone <laughs> and feeling safe in their body maybe more than ever and so pretty cool to hear that uh, because you know fight or flight is a real a real thing that if you've been living just in a way adjusted to it, then you might not even realize what it's like with a relaxation of that type of, I don't want to say like neurotic thinking or patterned thinking. Yeah, man, the whole lockdowns left a lot of people's Overton windows open for a long time. Never know what might've flown in the open window. <laughs> Jenny says, bring on the herbs. I'm I'm with you. Let's do that. <laughs> Bringing them on. Altoids. Oh, wait, peppermint. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So just because, you know, in uh in Gemini season, it is fun, it's whimsical, airy. Um, and I have a lot of air in my chart uh, that I my ego identifies with, at least. So when the season is right or when it's called upon, if you don't mind me humoring myself with a little cheekiness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like to talk about peppermint. And the thing I was thinking about is, what if um, the thrice great Hermes came to me in a dream? And of course, I couldn't picture this ascended master. I'd have to put overlap him onto an avatar. And, and uh, so that avatar comes to me as like Mike Tyson or somebody with a lisp. He says, um, I'm Hermes Trithmedithith, and let me teach you about the principles of all of the principles, the hermetic principles. And I said, all right, uh, what? All right, go ahead. <laughs> well, you're sounding a lot like your, uh, the original Kabbalists who are from <laughs> Barcelona. In Spain. Yeah. Spain. <laughs> Spain. <laughs> that's what Mike Tyson. Yeah, he's actually like he's like a, a Basque or something. So, all right, what are, what what are the principles? Go ahead, Hermes Trismegistus. Okay, the first, all is mine. All is mentha. All is mentha. 
All is menthol? Oh, okay. Menthols makes, are illegal it, now, Kyle. It makes sense to me because, oh, yeah, we have this bombardment of mentha everywhere. <laughs> and so I'd say, I'd reply like, oh, it's all mentha. Even, <laughs> even, even like the, the rainbow can and the candy canes and the cinnamon ones. And, you know, the reply would just be like, it's just in your mind. It's just all mine. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> that aside, <laughs> all is mentha. Uh, there, is, <laughs> there is something really, really strong about medicine that is familiar. It doesn't have to be uh, the strength of the essence of the medicine itself. It's the essence of its familiarity, just like a twin, just like a placenta. And the fact that peppermint has this familiarity makes it an incredibly potent medicine for just about anything. And it's true that peppermint is a great plant for um, headaches and it's great for the digestive system and it's great for opening up your sinuses and helping you breathe and, um, and all of these things. But it's, but, but a lot of times we forget that. And if we just have a bag of peppermint tea laying around next time you go to a hotel, just grab a couple of them. They're free, um, and take them home and keep them for when you need them. And whenever the next ailment comes up, just try something familiar. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll be in. I'll be in Las Vegas all week. Uh, <laughs> so I. One of the things I like about peppermint in general is that it's it's a great medicine for just about anything. One of the, the reasons why I chose it, though, for this particular vibrant, is because it is like one of our twins, a hybrid. This is not like, you know, pepper is one thing and mint is another. Just like uh, Zeus is one thing and the mother of Pollux was a, was a mortal woman, you know? And you put them together and what do you get? You get that mutable cross, that X, the, the, the hybrid. So it's a, it's a cross between um, mountain mint and spearmint or um, the... The world's tree mint and the and the Aries mint, we could say, um, <laughs> but uh, or or Aries mint and um, Taurus mint, and we get we get Gemini mint, which is the peppermint. But here I'm talking about peppermint, but we can say any kind of mint, really. We could say spearmint. We could say um, um, all all the chocolate mint, apple mint, orange mint. Any of the types of hybrids are all great for um, for all of these purposes, which are. Uh, great digestive aid. <laughs> nice. I like that. Yes. Mentor. Uh, great digestive aid. Great for clearing the senses, clearing the mind. Here's a, a plant of strong polarity. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's clearing the mind, but it also can be relaxing to the digestion. It can be stimulating to the digestion if you need to help something to eat. Um, if you have too much on your mind, you might relax it. If you can't focus because it's too cloudy, you can drink some peppermint and it helps it stimulate it. So we have these two, these opposites here. Um, piperita, that means pepper like, um, but it also means piper like, as in like a little, like a little flute, a little pipe flute thing. And that's a very airy instrument. Um, it's an instrument. It's not a percussive instrument. It's an instrument that you play with your vocal cords that you would express yourself in this mercurial uh, pan flute kind of way. Um, and here's a Gemini setting uh, saying, I should say, um, Peter Piper picked a pail of pickled peppers. All, all of that is it's fun. It's uh, expressive. And we're talking about pipers. We're talking about piperita. And I think, I don't know, where, what else could I go talk about mint that, that can't, that hasn't already been talked about? Uh, it's in cocktails, of course. It's in candies. It's in... Uh, mojitos. Mojitos, yep. And just the high concentration of volatile oils. And I think that we're going to see a real pattern here with a lot of these slides tonight is that we have plants that are, that might not be so showy. Their, their signatures might not be from their, the shape of their leaf or their 
or the the way that their flower looks it's it's in the smell it's in the scent it's in the volatile oils this mercurial quality that you can put into a copper still separate it distill it into an essential oil and a hydrosol um, essential oils that are very easy to capture and bring out when adding to adding to spirits as in alcohol you can make a tincture of these plants very easily as opposed to some plants that are higher in um, bitter compounds, which are easier in water, for example. So all of these, I think a lot of the mercurial plants, one of the signatures of mercurial plants are the way that they, um, they're volatile oils, really, most of all. And of course, the flower, look at the flower. We have a lot of, um, it even looks like a little pipe cleaner in a way. <laughs> um, and um, these, that pink to uh, whitish crown chakra looking colors that we have there. So very airy in all ways and spiritual as well. I think that's about all I can think about for peppermint here. Doesn't uh, doesn't peppermint have the ability to overgrow? Oh yeah, totally. So it likes to grow. One of the one one of the uh, hybridizations of it was that it doesn't like to spread seeds so much, but it does grow by underground roots or rhizomes. So it's, yeah, it's very prolific in the garden. It will take over places that you might not want it. Like a lot of mints do. A lot of mints will do yeah. that. Yeah. I have to fight back my spearmint every, uh, every year. It gets more and more expensive. I, funny enough, I usually will drink tea with a Vibram, but it's so warm. I wanted something a little more refreshing and cool. So I made like an infusion of water with, some blueberry and raspberry and strawberry, and then a bunch of big handfuls of the spearmint out of my garden. So that's cool that it just was the first herb on the list because I was like, you know, I didn't kind of preview it. So here I am sipping this and enjoying the minty flavor. And then boom, there we are. And this for some reason just makes me think of when I was uh, in high school, I was in a band and the, our lead singer, he was kind of a diva. And he had to like <laughs> constantly rub Vicks. He was like addicted to Vicks. He would like rub it on his chest. But most, <laughs> but if he was like out in public or there was some reason why he couldn't apply it properly, he just always had it handy and he was whiffing Vicks. He's like <laughs> Vicks vapor rub. Like he couldn't get enough. <laughs> <laughs> but there is this quality to it that is very Geminian in the sense that the, this type of mint can be applied topically and also have like a kind of loosening of constriction in the area of the lungs and opening that up. I'm not definitely not professional enough to know exactly what action it's doing in the biophysical, but I know it's used that way or mint is used that way. Would you say chance that, um, that when you drink spearmint, you feel cooler or warmer? Well, that's the interesting thing about it as a Gemini thing is that, there's this quality to heat and cold where in an extreme, it almost starts to cross over with each other, you know, <laughs> like the, the cold can burn and the heat can almost like numb the way cold can if it's extreme enough. So I, I, uh, I had this relationship with the sun that I developed through my energy work where I started to notice the other polarity in whatever extreme we were having at the moment. And I, I know this is just subjective, but when I started looking for the coolness in heat and the heat in coldness, I stopped being bothered by extremes and weather stopped suffering sunburns that would be like, you know, crippling or terrible and pretty much just quit all need for like skin protection in the sun, other than my own sort of common sense of, okay, I'm feeling that I should get out of the sun. And now it's like, at most, I'll just use some lavender if uh, I get a little red and it goes away. So I, I don't know if that's where you're going with this, but how like the extremes of hot and cold start to almost blur with each other, which is which. Right. Yeah, That's. I guess that's my point is that a, a plant of polarity, people... People might argue, oh, peppermint is cooling to me. It feels cooling. It makes me feel like I could feel my the, the air in my face. So it's cooling. But it, other people say it's stim it's warming. And I the word that I prefer is stimulating because it's stimulating your senses. These volatile oils bring our they have a, a consciousness altering effect. 
not like DMT or whatever, but like they change our perception where you can be in a meditative state. You could be in completely within yourself. And all of a sudden somebody's cooking up some rosemary in the other room or some garlic or something like that, something aromatic like peppermint. And all of a sudden your senses go, whoa, what's that out there? Like what, who's cooking something and what is it? Mm, smells good. It brings you, it brings your mind to a different place in a different location physically. So it's altering of consciousness. And that's the polarity I think that I, that I'm getting to with this, this mutant. Yeah. I love that point. Cause I was thinking that exact thing with the duality that you brought up with the temperature thing that happens with peppermint. Um, because when you use the essential oil, if you put too much on, it will burn, but there's still like that cooling aspect at the same time. And one of the things I always notice about peppermint when I'm working with dried peppermint and I swear, and maybe other people have felt this, but when I have a jar of peppermint and like I put my hands into the jar or near the herb itself, when it's dried, I swear I can feel the coolness coming from it. And maybe it's just me or whatever, but I, I really can pick up on that um, energy, the cooling energy. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's important to remember the different, the, the temperature thing and how the lines can be blurred with cool and hot. But, I just wondered, has anyone else felt that coolness <laughs> from dried peppermint leaf? I don't know. It's, it's I don't think I don't think I can say I have, uh, but I do think I can think of it. Like when I when I think of peppermint, the coolness on my nose, I can mm -hmm. sense a coolness from this. You know, the idea of the scent, the memory of the scent. Uh, but also I'll throw out the, you know, the spear aspect, you know, these flowers have a spear shape, um, you know, spear mint. Um, yeah, uh, the word German, it also uh, connotes a spearsman, one who is holding a spear, the jir, the uh, G-E-R, some places it's a G-I-R, is a spear uh, linguistically. Uh, so that's another aspect of the twins of the Gemini and the Germans and the Hermanos embraced. They're also spearsmen as well. Dude, uh, a lot of Sagittarius depictions, he was carrying a spear, not a bow and arrow. That's and of so course, cool. Sagittarius is the time of year, you know, leading us up to Christmas. And you might see a lot of peppermint candies around at that time of year. So true. That's so true. And then also there's the spear of destiny. I don't, I don't know if you've ever looked into that line of mythology. Right. But, um, there's that, which is Germanic in nature, yeah. I believe. You know, oh. in, while we're talking about like that bridge from like here in the spring down there to the underworld where Sagittarius, where we're going into the winter, um, uh, Hades had a nymph who was his beloved, uh, one of the earlier and more obscure stories, he was in love with a nymph whose name was uh, Men Menthis. I think her name was Menthis. And she was turned into a mint plant. And so this particular plant would be Hades' first pick as well. So it's appropriate in that aspect uh, that we're starting off with this kick. Shout out to Hades. Boop, boop, boop. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> yes. Since you bring it up, not just the mental aspect of mentha, but it's also M I N T, the other mercurial uh, station of making money, the place where you print money, coin money um, for tr the transactions as well. And, and, and the reason why I was inspired with our, my cheeky first slide was. I was thinking that a candy cane is a very mercurial uh, little <laughs> staff, right? You're hanging your little, uh -huh. hanging your little mercury on your on your pole, the North Pole that you're bringing inside of your house, and um, hoping that you get presents and whatnot. You can offer those. There's the caduceus, like the single snake um, caduceus. What's that? Whatever that's called, and um, it's going up the the shepherd's crook of this uh, mercurial staff. Totally. And, and yeah, the money. And, exactly. You know, yeah. and that, that, that's kind of why I asked about like, can it overgrow too much? It's like, kind of like, can your bank, can your mint 
over print <laughs> can be very problematic. Yeah, Kyle, to your point, um, it's the shepherd's crook. And my personal opinion is that when you look at the hermit card, you're looking at a former shepherd, uh, a former guide of souls. And so uh, I think essentially when you're looking at the hermit card, you're looking at a uh, advanced aged Christ, basically. And the hermit card corresponds with Virgo, which is ruled by Mercury. Um, and then regarding mint, the word mint, uh, my understanding, I've said this before, but that a lot of words that start with M vowel N relates back to the moon and uh, the cycles of the moon being a way to measure time and to measure all sorts of different things, hence minute, month, moonth, right? And whenever I think of Thoth, the Egyptian Thoth, you know, I generally think of uh, mercurial things, right? But uh, Thoth was the uh, god of the moon as well. So um, there's so much lunar symbolism associated with Thoth that, you know, kind of can't be ignored or whatever. So I think there is a connection there, the M-I-N, potentially going back to the moon, but also very heavily, you know, relates to uh, Thoth and Mercury. And even, you know, the mercurial symbol, the, the glyph for Mercury, he has those horns right there, which, you know, can be interpreted as uh, a crescent moon sort of uh, thing. So, and then also the whole entire thing with the pipe, I think that's fascinating too, because I have some cards that depict Mercury, and these cards are fairly old, I think from like the 16th century or something like that, but um, it shows Mercury with a, with a flute, with a pipe, you know, that he's actually playing. So you can actually find older depictions of Mercury, and he has, you know, one of those instruments. So uh, just adding to that connection. And then Mercury, too, also relates to the phallus, you know, and the pole and the pillar and all this other kind of stuff. So which just reminds me of that pipe. It's like the flute is the phallic lute, <laughs> the phallute. <lute. laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. I got to shout out some of the people over on the Rockfin chat and give thanks for the super chats from Logan Cook and Jason Reed. He says, love you guys. Lisa Rose says we are big fans of the series with her super chat. Thank you. Braden says, G money. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And Braden also mentioned that uh, he thinks his skin is better in the, in the sun after he stopped wearing sunglasses. And I also, you know, maybe that's the correlation of why I don't really get uh, bad sunburns at all is because I quit wearing sunglasses. I think there's probably something to that for sure. Yeah, the, the receptors in your eyes are there's a lot of melanin in your eyes. And, and when you have uh, the light coming into your eyes, it tells your body to adjust um, the melanin. Just like when you taste something, um, it tells the rest of your body how to set up your digestion as opposed to bypassing that with a, with a, a capsule or something like that. You're really missing a lot of the medicinal process. And hey, Lisa, and hey, Scott, hi. All right. So uh, unless we need to say more about peppermint, I'm sure that you could talk about peppermint for its own, you know, <laughs> hour or two show. It's so versatile. Well, here we have uh, lavender, which, you know, when you look at the peppermint that there's such a similar, you know, flower structure going on with the pointy top and the outward stretching blossoms that come from the lavender. But, you know, this is one of the more famous plants a lot of people know about, especially in the essential oil world. You know, it kind of almost gets overplayed to the point where some people are totally turned off by lavender just because it's been so just overplayed. But it's for a reason, you know, because it is it is such a pleasant scent. It's not everybody's favorite, as I was saying, but, you know, I personally love it and I find it to be um, it has almost like there's such a heady scent to it. Um, and I think that's part of the mercurial connection with it as well, because we're dealing with energy that kind of goes straight to the the head. Um, I always think of lavender being associated with the crown chakra, uh, the third eye. Um, 
helping with, um, you know, like lifting or softening the veil is something that I think of with lavender. And when we're dealing with the Gemini energy, which can sometimes get heightened, sometimes anxiety is something that people with a lot of Gemini or air can um, deal with. You know, they might find themselves being more anxious. Lavender, as many people know, is an ally for anxiety and just like a racing mind and things like that, because it's really just even just smelling the lavender scent really kind of calms you down almost instantly, um, at least in my experience and a lot of the experience of a lot of others. But the other thing, too, that it really helps is there, there's a there's a quickness, just like with that mercurial energy. So I find that lavender can actually help to open up channels of communication much better. Um, so so that could be something that you could, uh, you know, work with if you are having to do do something like what we're doing now, where you're having to communicate. So you're having an open line with with multiple people. You're going back and forth. Uh, lavender is really great for that because I think it's good for that because it calms you down to the point where it gives you a, it helps you take a moment to think before you speak. And I think that that's very important, uh, regardless if you're speaking in front of people or you're literally just having a conversation with one other person, or you're having a conversation with yourself, <laughs> because how many times are we talking to ourselves and you're talking so quickly? There's so many thoughts that you can get oh, overwhelmed. Just like you were talking about chance with the person uh, with the OCD. Sometimes you you know, your own thoughts become your enemy sometimes, you know, and lavender could really, really help somebody with that sort of, um, you know, process that goes on. Um, you know, let's see, I'm just going to scan my notes quick. Yes. What I wanted to talk about is how I love making infused oil with lavender, specifically with the fresh lavender buds. And now, uh, in our region right now, so we're in zone eight, a, um, the lavender is like, almost it's it's not quite like opening or separating so it's actually a really good time to start working with it because the uh, essential oils are very strong um, but over the next like couple days um, I'm going to start making lavender oil and I wanted to talk about it because I find that when you make uh, lavender oil with fresh lavender you're able to harness the scent of fresh lavender so well. Um, and I've never been able to do it quite as well as I can with dried lavender. And so one of the things I like to do is uh, harvest lavender buds in the morning before the essential oils are, you know, lifted off with the sun and the heat and, um, you know, prick them off, put them into a jar. And I always use a hundred proof vodka, like a teaspoon of it maybe, or even less. Um, and add that to the um, to the flower buds themselves because it kind of opens up the pores of the flower and it also will help to preserve your oil a little better because whenever you're making um, an oil with fresh herbs, you have to be careful because there's more moisture in the in the plant. So um, that can you know that can cause mold to grow. But if you have just a tiny bit of alcohol or another high proof alcohol in there, it really does prevent that. And I. And it actually really brings out the scent much better, I find. And so if you're going to do something like this, you would just fill up your jar, do your vodka or your high proof alcohol. You can even like let it evaporate a little bit from the jar and then fill it with oil and cover it up really well. I like to put a piece of like wax paper over the top of the jar and then seal it off with a lid. Um, and I like to put this in like a, in a cool dark place uh, for about four to six weeks and then you can strain that off. And uh, one important thing I wanted to mention about that is like when you're working also with fresh plants, never squeeze like your cheesecloth that you're straining through because you can actually um, strain some of the moisture that might be stuck in those flowers into your oil, which then could cause mold if you're like shelving it. Um, and then from that, you can use this oil for so many things. You can just use it as is, um, just as a skin a healing oil, a relaxing oil. It's a great muscle rub. You could, you know, turn it into a, a salve if you wanted to. There's a lot of options with it. Um, and so I wanted to kind of like throw that in for everybody who might want to experiment with that. Um, and I find that lavender blends really well with oat straw and kava kava. Um, and so I like to make, um, 
uh, like an anxiety reducing tea with oat straw, kava kava, lavender, and a little bit of peppermint. And then sometimes I'll throw in like some stevia leaf just to bring a little uh, sweetness to that. And that's a really nice tea um, that can just calm you down and uh, really help just like balance out any nerves you might be feeling. Um, it's really great before bed as well. And that's yeah, my weave on lavender. <laughs> la lavender oil has uh, saved me from some uh, <laughs> facial scarring. This is a legit story. This I got to share this one. <laughs> I was pulling out my ninja sword. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I kind of know where this is going Perfect. already. <laughs> <laughs> and I pulled it out too hard and too fast. And I split my right between my own eye uh just a, i mean a per and it was like uh you could see the shape of it it was like you could see a cleaving in the middle of my own head um and yeah thanks to uh lavender oil you can't see that scar anymore but it was so silly i was being very stupid wow crazy this uh in the in facial diagnostics this part right between the eye is um indication of your liver so maybe you were just doing some like major like acupuncture for your, your liver channel or something <laughs> like that <laughs> wow. uh big old detox so um in, in as far as lavender goes oh thanks chance for sh sharing that too this is a essential oil roll on what this is a little different than what michelle was talking about michelle was talking about making an infused oil and i really like this is how i make my infused oils too uh, by adding a little bit of alcohol prior to making the oil, you're adding this mercurial quality to the plants and, and allowing that the cells, everything that's inside of the, the cell membrane of the plants to be opened up and pulled out into the next medium. And it really does help um, make your oils very, very rich by just adding a little bit of, of, of alcohol prior to doing that. Um, but when it comes to the air signs like Gemini, Virgo and Aquarius. Uh, no, sorry, I got that wrong. Gemini, Libra and uh, Aquarius, but Virgo also lavender would be really helpful for too um, because of the mercury co correspondence. Um, we're, one of the things that we deal with, with with a lot of airiness is just flightiness, the inability to have traction due to material boots on the ground going. So one of the things that's really, really helpful for stimulating movement in an air sign is something that has a little bit of uh, sedative quality and relaxing quality. So you're up here, a lot of stuff is going on. Now all of a sudden you drop, you drop it in gear. It's just like revving up an engine without, without it being in gear. And it's just going room, room, room. You take it down into gear, take it down in first gear. And now you're going where everybody else that's already has their boots on the ground, they're slowing back down again because they're, because they're in going into first gear. Um, so it actually has, again, there's that thing about not that uh, lavender is uh, often thought about as stimulating, but the way that it, and, and to me, the way that I think about it vitally working in the body as a relaxant is that it's taking a lot of energy that's start that's just like stuck up in the head and it's letting it move downwards and out in the circulation. And as such, this is why lavender is such a good remedy for burns. Chance was mentioning uh, lavender oil for sunburn. Oh, and it applies to regular burns too. Oh, exactly. Regular All burns. burns. Regular I'm glad you're going into this. I was going to ask why does lavender work on burns? Because it is super effective. Because it is working by spreading out the circulation over the surface. So if you get a burn, you can make things worse and, and keep that scar in place. And, and uh, using Gabriel's model here, if you didn't use lavender, that, that tissue would kind of build up. If you were to put like an ice cube on, on your burn, it just drives that heat down, 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 and it avoids it from, uh, from being expressed outwards. But by having something like lavender, which works on the circulation, it spreads it off across the surface. This is why you can lay on a bed of nails and not and not poke your back because you're spreading out that surface over the course of, of your whole body. And that's the same kind of a metaphor with lavender for burns is that it's moving that burn outwards and allowing it to just be minimally painful. If that makes sense. 
Yeah, that's a great point. I love too that you brought up the ice cube on on a burn because I always now I always treat burns with warm <laughs> and it will like sting more if you burn yourself and you run warm water instead of cold water. Obviously, the cold water makes it feel better. But that's such a great point that it's literally just suppressing it. And if you were to use like warmer water, it kind of stings a little bit more. But I've found that the burn heals much quicker if you're if you're treating the like hot with hot. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So yeah, thank you for bringing up that point about the lavender and how it spreads. That's that's some good juju right there. Good wisdom. Yeah, man. That's, I mean, I think everyone should just have a lavender roll on in their <laughs> medicine cabinet or on to, on hand, especially if you're going out into the sun. But I I use it all the time. Like I burned my thumb on something cooking the other day. And I was looking and looking and I, this was probably four or five days ago and I found the spot where it was now, but there's barely any mark. So it's like one application of the lavender right after it happened and you just kind of forget about it. <laughs> it takes the pain out uh, largely, but also the healing process seems that much more efficient. I could talk all day about it how many times it saved me. <laughs> it's kind of like as good of a hack as Rachel pointing out here, the cayenne pepper stops bleeding or a bit, you know? Yeah, that's the best. I did a hour and a half long podcast on my, on my new little podcast show called root radical that Mario has made the, the logo for, by the way, which is awesome working with him. And uh, so if you're interested in learning about cayenne, I go an hour and a half hard on that one. And it's, it's very cool. I love talking about the bleeding aspect. And I also, since uh, my, my internet was sh being shitty earlier and I had to come up to my other location, um, I did, I, when we were talking about the new things going on, the thing that I wanted to mention was I was doing, uh, I hired Mario to help me with a logo and it was so cool to <laughs> have somebody that has such great symbolic, uh, <laughs> library and uh and be able to embed that into a little mimetic pattern of a logo so i'm really excited to move forward in this uh this project that i'm working on to root radical it's very cool i can't wait to show you the logo once it's done thanks man the pleasure was all mine dude you were great to work with as well and uh, i'm stoked to see it out in the wild and get used for sure right. yeah it came out very nice i must say as well one other thing I want to say about lavender too is it's in the mint family. And so, um, and we'll probably maybe talk about this more, but like the mints, a lot of the mints have like relaxation sort of qualities to them. That's one thing I just wanted to throw in there. A lot of, a lot of times, uh, people don't, don't know that because lavender doesn't seem like a mint, but some other mints are like that. They're not minty, but they're in that mint family. So anyway, interesting you know how the mint family does you know, feel related to the air elements strongly. What comes to mind is how, if you've ever just eaten a mint or you have that minty saturation on your skin or in your mouth, and then you feel the air blow across or you inhale, it like activates the cells where the mint has saturated. So mm -hmm. it's like, there's this interactivity with the air and the mint and the, the mind and the wind and all of that, it seems yeah. like quite literal. You know, I want to maybe uh, make a comment one more time about government and how just theoretically, if we were a tea drinking culture, if drinking tea on a regular basis was like a staple fundamental experience, of even of our identity, like where, you know, Kyle does his pinky that one way. He's got the one way he holds his pinky. Well, that's because he's from that part of town. You know what I mean? Like that kind of relationship to T, then the idea of like, the, yeah, right, right. We're taking a sacrament. You know what I mean? All of these things would just, I just, uh, I think there's something really fascinating about how it's almost like giving tithing or ceremoniously acknowledging uh, the one thing that binds us. Uh, you know, when I say government, there's a part of me that is like, uh, fuck that. But then there's another part of, that should be like, you know, we're all in this together. Cheerio. And we should all be, you know, 
toast, pour a little out to our homies, whatever. Be seeing you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Be seeing you. <laughs> you are number six. Now you've been, now you've been getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> waiting anxiously to talk about the prisoner with you i have a quick thing to uh share regarding lavender just something i'm noticing right now but uh lavender and if you want to pull up the image again just because it's uh relevant with the uh color of lavender which is beautiful and matches what michelle's wearing as well today awesome. but um lav that's interesting lave means uh to wash or bathe to flow along or against, to wash oneself. And so to me, that's really interesting given the nature of some of the things you guys are talking about with Lavender. And then it just reminds me of the star card, of the Crowley star card, which is essentially this color, you know, I would say. And what is she doing? She's pouring two cups, just like all star cards, right? And she's nude. And it's also related to Aquarius, another air sign. And so to me, there's just this bathing sort of kind of cleansing quality that I'm picking up regarding the, the L-A-V-E right there and how it potentially relates to some of this other stuff I'm bringing up. Yeah, good Great call, point. Man. Yep. And so many times lavender is used in bath salts and things where you will be kind of pampering yourself in that way of cleansing yourself. And then... Um, how is it that, isn't it um, lavar? How do you say it in Spanish, to wash? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, lavar. I think it's lavar. Or, um, so something, yeah. along, uh, something nice. like that. I think that there's something connected there. Yeah. You know, philologically, too, with mint and mind, I'm realizing that it basically is the same word with T and D interchanging as they do and vowels being so willy nilly <laughs> meant and uh, mind are actually the same word. And then government is cover meant cover mind. It's a covering of your mind. I don't know if that fits, but I think, I think it does. Well, now that, now that I know that Hades first love turned into the plant of mint, it really corresponds with the corporation theme of the government being the realm of the dead. You know what I mean? I mean, it really fits. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of fun to be had in that, in light of that, uh, you know, eighties, man, it's crazy. Ever since I started paying more attention to him, it's like, I mean, he was, it was that way all along. It's been that way all along, but yeah, <laughs> government is Hades, Hades lady. <laughs> it was mine to be. All right. <laughs> Lovely plant. Now here in, here in Gemini in the tropical astrological tradition, we have an air sign. The next one cancer, we got water. And finally, when we get to Leo, that's when we're talking about, the solar connections and everything like that. But of course, if you look outside right now, you can't deny the sun is high. And as Roger Miller would say, and so am I. Um, but the this plant is, uh, so yeah, we have a lot of solar qualities here with this plant, obviously. Look at the sun beam looking flower. But uh, Michelle and I, we were being mutable. We were going back and forth. Michelle was saying, I'm going to do a campaign. I was like, yes, sweet, because I love this plant and I can do it. This is in my garden here. And I could do a great Ella campaign weave. And then at the last minute, she was like, I'm not going to. And I was like, well, then I am. She put it back in the in the, in the the discard pile and told me to go fish. So I changed <laughs> it. You know, I'm so, I'm so glad you did because, yeah, I'm just so glad you did because there's so much to say about this beauty. So. I'm excited to hear your weave. All right. So as far as the medicinal uh, aspects go, uh, I'll talk about that and then I'll chum the astro theological waters a little bit. Um, so we have the, <laughs> we have uh, a plant that is very specifically indicated for the lungs and 
how can we tell? Well, we can tell by the lung leaves. Anytime you see a plant that has big old leaves like that, that's a signature for the lungs. And if you look at the one on the bottom, those two on the bottom, they're kind of curling up and underneath the leaf, you'll see it's very fuzzy and hairy. Whenever you see little cilia on the leaf, that's indicated for mucosal membranes. Um, and so that's the realm of mercury, the mucosal membranes. We have mucosal membranes in our lungs. We have mucosal membranes in our sinuses. We have them in our, um, in our intestines. And this, uh, this is the realm between um, outer and inner, bringing something in to us, right? It has to pass through these barriers. And those are those little hairs they call, they're called cilia. That's why celiac disease is a, is a disease of those little hairs in the intestines that are flattened. They're no longer statically and electromagnetically uh, movable, like little antennae. And um, so it's the root of this plant that is a really, really, really nice um, lung remedy. It is uh, very mercurial in that it is bitter and bitter herbs are bring us bring our energy inwards, but it's also very, very aromatic and aromatic herbs bring our energy outwards. So we're like, ah, where am I going? <laughs> when you take something that's both bitter and aromatic and it's both of those times 10, it's very bitter, it's very aromatic and um, aromatic bitters have a strong affinity for moving um, fluids in the body from the inside of the body out. So this is why I think about bitter aromatics as having a great relationship as expectorants, which means that it helps you break up phlegm in your lungs and move them out <clears throat> because it, because something bitter brings you in something aromatic <clears throat> brings it out. Now, if you have, um, uh, phlegm and mucus that's in your body, that's been baked in by heat, um, too much like you have a, a dryness in there, or if you have a lot of damp stagnation, so both dampness or dryness, but particularly, let's say like dryness that's been baked in by heat. Imagine having like a, a casserole or a lasagna and you, you heat it up and you had just a couple of pieces and then you put it back in the freezer, refrigerator or whatever. The next time you put it in the oven, then you're heating up the, the second half of the lasagna. And that first half where you didn't have the, the tray gets like really, really baked and really hard to clean. And the same thing can happen with the mucus in the lungs. It can get dried up so much by the heat. And we don't, one of the things that you could do is like, you know, you can have some uh, mucosal lubricants that are like uh, marshmallow, things that are like moistening to that. But the best thing to do is to move that, the fluids from the inside of the body and kind of scrub it from within the pan itself. If, if, if you're get, following my metaphor. Um, so this is a great remedy for expectorating. It's specifically indicated for the type, the color mucus that the flower is green and yellow. If you ever see that going on in your snot, um, that would be a specific remedy, a specific indication for LA campaign. And, and also for mucus that you're hacking up and swallowing, and it's affecting your digestion. So this brings me to the name, elecampane. The botanical name is Inula helenium. Inula is indication of the inulin, which is a non-digestible fiber that helps. Um, it's a prebiotic. It stimulates the, uh, the biota, the good biota in our, in our um, biome, microbiome, to, to break things apart. It's good bacteria food for your gut. Um, and the, the name Ella campaign means Helen of the campaign of the Campania of the field, Helen of the field. Why? Because Helen of Troy, um, ever heard of her? Helen of Troy, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> well, one day she was minding her own business as some stories say, and she got abducted by Paris. Uh, and then they sent, they sent out a, a party and they did the Trojan War. In other accounts, she was charmed and she went on her own accord. Well, in any case, where she went across the field, her teardrops fell to the ground and outspring the Ella campaign from the field. And that's how they were able to find her. That's why they were able to track her down because her tears turned into this thing. Wow. So, so this is a plant also emotionally specific for uh, coughing up that junk, that phlegm in your throat on an emotional level where you have been, uh, where, where especially a woman like my wife, 
who has left her homeland and come to another. And she, may, she might not be able to communicate or she longs for her homeland. And there's this welling, this swelling in your throat, the inability to communicate or have, that, have your, uh, your words land and have meaning or be able to communicate your sorrow and swallow that down. Um, and so that's a, that's a specific indication because it helps with, it helps with, uh, with digestion as well. So this is a, a Virgo Gemini crossover plant. And the word inula is really interesting to me too, because it means, uh, in, uh, or inulin, I should say the, the prebiotic inulin, it means, um, in, Inula is the same uh, related to annul, annula, um, annulment, as in like zeroing out. You're zero, zeroing something out within. So there's me, there's Kyle, there's the I am. And then there's this stuff that's going on inside of me that also has its own vital force. And, um, and maybe that can become over, overgrown. Maybe it makes me crave ice cream at too late at night or something like that. Um, and anyway, it has its own little mind. And when you, when you are able to nourish the, that part within you, your own microbiome, the, the good salubrious part that is, that I would say is within me, it brings that, that, uh, annulment within it brings that to, uh, to a zero. So now I am <laughs> who I am and all, all of my tubes that are also hollow tubes inside of me are also part of me as well. And they're not their own little microbiome. It is all me. And that's what the, I think is a, a really great medicine of this plant is to really annul all of that and to make it one again. And uh, so that's Ella Campaign. That's my Ella Campaign weave. Beautiful, dude. That was great. Yeah, I love it. Agreed. I love how you brought in the Helen of Troy weave, which is kind of Persephone-esque in terms of the abduction element and being in the field in that springtime thing <laughs> and then the you know the the sorrow of being abducted and good thing to bring to the table is how since we are talking gemini and gemini has this lungs correlation that the lungs are in terms of our biofield anatomy a place where grief can get hung up and so i was just gonna say that <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah this is a very important thing to know and like it's good to just remind everyone out there from time to time because there could be somebody for example that has had an on again off again relationship with smoking and they want to stop or it's mostly on but they know that they should stop and possibly a missing piece for them or what might help them comprehend why they keep getting pulled back to it is because they may be suppressing some kind of grief or pushing down some kind of sadness that needs to be felt and expressed and acknowledged. And, and that the pattern of smoking is typically or very often related to that repression. I wouldn't say everything's hundred percent of the time, all the time means exactly the same thing, but generally speaking, if there's something hindering the functioning of your lungs, it's also because it's hang, hang, you're hung up on what it is that you don't want to fully allow yourself to lament, if you will. And then that, you know, like with anything, it's a similar with losing weight, losing weight, emotions are going to come off <laughs> with the, you know, with the fat that is excess. And so any kind of like healing process of the body requires to actually feel the emotions, but the, uh, the sadness, grief, lungs connection is, is, seems like it should be part of this conversation. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because when I think of Ellie campaign, I, my, I, my first thought is lungs. And then I think of the sadness element, but then I think of the bright and cheery color of that flower. And it's like also bringing that, it's like bringing the light that you might need when you're feeling the grief. Um, that's very, just a nice contrast, uh, to it. So it's, it's really interesting. And the inulin, um, I like that you talked about that too, because that's also found in dandelion root. And so they both have that similar, very bright, shiny yellow flower. Um, so there must be some kind of connection there. Well, it makes me think of bile actually um, when I think of that. And so going in with the gut and, and feeding the good bacteria with the, with the prebiotics is, uh, is an interesting connection there too. 
And, um, you know, this plant to me, I think of friendship. Um, I think of friendship because I was firstly gifted Ellie campaign from a really good friend of mine and her Ellie campaign has just like grown so prolifically, uh, after planting it. And, um, also this was one of the strongest allies for our cat. And, um, he had, you know, really intense, um, mucus and, uh, respiratory issues where he had, um, he had a lot of coughing and congestion and like asthma, like feline asthma. And I will say out of all the things that I would concoct for him, Ellie campaign was always the thing that really helped him the most, you know, because, um, it also has that ability to, if there is some sort of infection going on, can kind of help to break up infection as well. Instead of just breaking up mucus, it can actually kind of get to the heart of what's going on. And I think that that goes along with it being a root medicine and it being so potent and pungent um, and root medicines kind of being the thing that can actually kind of like really get into deep spaces or maybe something that's chronic or something that's been lingering or whatever, Ellie campaign can sometimes be the thing that really knocks it out for somebody that's been like dealing with something that's, that's been kind of like bogging them down for a long time. And I find the scent of Ellie campaign, uh, the dried root to just be so beautiful and pleasant. And it, I would say it's probably one of my favorite, like herbal smells. Um, I even have a hard time describing it, but it just, if you ever get a chance to just get some dry root and just take a deep whiff, <laughs> it is seriously so nice and pleasant. I always think about, man, I'd love to make this into some kind of perfume or cologne or something. Cause it would just be beautiful to walk around smelling like a Ellie campaign root. <laughs> Can I tell you that the, my coworker Paige, she says that it smells like an old man, an old sophisticated man that is hanging out at a bookstore that smokes a pipe, his cologne, like that kind of, that's what it smells like. I love that. It That's a, that's a really great way to describe it. <laughs> hey, what do you guys think about the connection between Campania, the com campaign, the field, and like a campaign, a, pol a political campaign or the, the movement of, what do, what do you think about that? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, companionship, right? Like, yeah, I was. I, that's actually what I wrote down. Um, there was a uh, just in the past few months, there was an image of Xi Jinping and uh, Putin in their cheersing, they're toasting one another with champagne. So they're both sipping champagne, and I was thinking about it. I was like, how many? phonetic uh puns are are in this image here you know they're okay now they're gonna have a campaign you know a military campaign they're sipping champagne they're now companions you know they're now uh combining their efforts together what's that i'm obsessed with the smell <laughs> nice. uh but yeah um there's definitely something, yeah, bonding. It makes me think of bonding. You know what I mean? When you sip champagne, it's a it's a moment of connection, you know, an intimacy. I think of uh, the word camp and the uh, military use of camps and traveling camps. And there's lots of mythology about camps and being uh, mobile and nomadic and everything else. <laughs> That's hilarious. What's up, PK? PK can't hear Gabe over his sleeves. <laughs> and so one of the other things, too, that I uh, thought was really fascinating, uh, Ross Ben has this book called uh, The Rocks of Ages and uh, or Rock of Ages. And in it, he goes through the different cycles of Egyptian time during the different ages of uh you know the signs basically so he goes through what happened in egyptian mythology during you know cancer you know the age of cancer the age of leo etc and he said during the age of gemini is when a lot of aggression and conflict bubbled up and that there was warring factions and that new weapons were being created and everything else so he very much relates it to conflict and warfare and everything else and so as i was saying earlier uh, the babylonian great twins you know they held weapons basically and so um 
there's definitely a connection between campaigns and warfare and uh and gemini this idea of uh two factions going against each other and everything else but camp is what yeah like doing. march you're gonna be marching out and then by gemini season it the war might go hot you know the the armies may have finally crossed the fields and reached each other yeah yeah good point it even has the word pain in it <laughs> ah well it's also got the whole bread thing going on as well calm calm pan with bread you know that's part of what makes a country a country all right licorice seeing a theme here with the way these plants appear yeah, yeah. isn't that cool i know that that kind of like a cone-like shape of the flower and the spike out you know the the flowers that kind of like protrude outward um which i think is very mercurial and it also kind of indicates like some of the stimulating aspects of some of the, some of what's going on here with these plants um and i find too like the pointy herbs or sorry the pointy herbs the the leaves of this um plant too kind of are feathery and so it always makes me think of like a bird's wing or a feather on a bird or something which then connects to air um as well and with licorice this is actually the one that bumped ellie campaign for me because i was thinking about licorice um and i was like man you know it's such a great um uh, just lovely sweet remedy and that's what a lot of people know it for the licorice root is very sweet and you don't a little bit can bring so much sweetness to a tea um and so there's like the sweetness of gemini season the sweetness of this time of year i think um kind of comes along with that and then we're also dealing with the, the lungs with licorice because it's uh, known as a demulcent um it's also in which means it's going to be very soothing almost almost sort of coating coating like so if you're having trouble um, you know, maybe breathing or speaking, or you're having a hoarse sort of throat going on, you have a sore throat, uh, licorice is very soothing to both of those um, situations. Um, and it's always just been one of my favorites to pair actually with peppermint. Um, and I'm currently drinking spearmint and licorice tea because one of the things that licorice is really good at, it's like very thirst quenching. Um, and so it can help prevent dry mouth. Um, and so if you're talking, you're in a situation, maybe you're going to be giving a speech or something like that, you know, um, it's it could be really nice to add licorice to your water or have licorice tea next to you um because it can just help to lubricate your mouth and not make you feel like it's all you know it's because dry mouth can make it very hard to talk and then you can be self-conscious about it and there are all these things and so licorice is really great to kind of mitigate that um and i find it just to be a very beautifully uh beautifully looking plant like i said beautiful be beautiful taste to it um one of the cool things i love about licorice root is or licorice is that it is also a root medicine i don't know if i mentioned that already but the root itself can be chewed when you dry the root a lot of times like people will actually chew on the root for oral health. You can give a licorice root to a baby who's teething and that can be very soothing. Um, it's not necessarily pain relieving, but that demulcent quality can kind of help to just like keep things lubricated, you know? Um, and I just always remember working when I worked at the herb shop uh, way in the beginning of my herbal journey um, times, people walking around the herb shop uh, just chewing on licorice roots. And I just have such fun memories of all of us like standing there, a group of us and customers coming in and then asking, what are you chewing on? And then, oh, licorice root. And then you have a customer who goes and buys some licorice root. And they're like, I'm going to try that. I'll take it home. And it was just like this chain reaction or whatever. I recently learned that um, licorice root is highly regarded in hoodoo practices, um, specifically when uh, a pr practitioner is helping someone with like a commanding or a mind altering or control 
sort of um, spell. Um, not saying that that's I I'm not interested in doing that, but I learned that tidbit and I thought it was interesting uh, because I think that there's something having to do maybe even with the sweetness element of it. Like sweetness can be enticing sometimes. So if you're trying to maybe control somebody or you're wanting to cast some sort of love spell, like I said, not condoning that or whatever, but do what you do. Um, but that sweetness element of it might be part of what that um, is connected to um, when you're thinking about it on, on that level. Um, I think sweetness and mind control do go hand in hand. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think dude, there's any question about that. Yeah, man. Honey trap. I mean, that that is right there. So it kind of like it brings you in sort of thing. Um, I already mentioned the licorice and spearmint tea um, that I'm drinking, but I highly recommend if um, if you do like mint tea to get yourself some licorice root and you can literally just add like a pinch and that goes a long way. And depending on how sweet you like it, because sometimes I've even made the tea where um, you can actually have too much and it's almost just too much, you know, um, too much sweetness. I'm um, just like anything that's a little bit too sweet. And actually, you know, licorice, the root was used as um, a sweetener in um, all sorts of things back in the day. And also, from what I can tell, licorice was inspired by licorice root itself because it was so sweet. And that's like the original kind of OG flavor of what licorice is actually what we're what's what's going on with it or Kind of like the marshmallow plant, you know, uh, marshmallows can be made using marshmallow root, you know, same kind of thing. So there's all these connections with that uh, for sure. And um, this is also a really great ally if you're dealing with uh, cold sores or fever blisters. Um, fever blisters is just something that I've dealt with uh, since a young age. And I've, uh, you know, frequently when I've experienced them uh, made a paste using powdered licorice root um, and even honey and then just applying that right to the cold sore because sometimes um, it can actually help just like really calm things down. Again, the, the, the emulsant qualities um, can even be just be very soothing um, to like that stingingness that comes from it. Um, and, you know, if you depending on how you look at, um, you know, whether there's viruses or not, um, if you look up on normie um, kind of websites about licorice, it'll talk about how it can be a remedy for herpes viruses. Um, and so I just think that it is more about the soothingness that comes from the licorice, not necessarily that the licorice is fighting off a virus. I think that there's just something that soothes that um, that that inflamed tissue that happens, that redness. Um, and also, um, if you're looking at it from a GNM, uh, German New Medicine perspective, a cold sore would be related to a separation um, conflict. So uh, perhaps licorice being that thing, just like the hoodoo practitioner um, helping somebody with a, a, a spell where they're wanting to attract or maybe control or something like that, the licorice might give you a sense of control if you feel like you've been separated separated from something um, and it was maybe out of your control, the licorice might give you that essence of control that you could help just to like that, that actually might be more of the spiritual connection, spiritual or emotional connection that licorice is actually helping to heal uh, when it comes to it. Um, and uh, yeah, a beautiful plant. I just love it. There's also a, a wild uh, licorice that's out there too. So it's not as showy as this one, as usually the wild versions of plants are not as showy as um, the other like garden cultivated um, plants can be. I think so, the glyce, the glyce in that Latin name has to do with blue, maybe. No, it has, no, it has to do with glycerin. Sweet. Rhizo, okay. rhizome, sweet root, and then okay. glabra is, I don't know what glabra is, but glycer is like glycerin, like sweet, and then rhizome, but I don't know what glabra is. Nice. Yeah, that second picture you just had up, Chance, that's the actual licorice root itself. So you what can buy it. You can buy it like that. Um, you can buy like the whole roots at shops. A lot of times uh, Kyle and Serena probably carry that. And then a lot of times you'll find it where it's ground up um, and then uh, you can find it powdered as well uh, for things, 
you know, you can, you know, it's lovely. Another thing that's really wonderful is slippery elm and you can make like what what are called slippery elm ba balls. Susan Weed um, is really uh, adamant about sharing her recipes about that, but usually there'll be licorice root powder that's added to that because the slippery elm and the licorice just really like if you're having a sore throat or whatever, oh gosh, it's, it's seriously so soothing. And it's just basically like powdered herbs mixed with honey and you just roll them up into little balls and you have your own medicine ball very quick way to make some something with powdered herbs if you don't have like a compounding thing or you don't want to encapsulate something you can literally bind things with honey and and just you know take it internally that way wow that sounds amazing they are amazing. They're super fun to make too, especially if you have kids. It's a really fun project for kids to be able to, you know, roll roll those things up and uh, you can store them really well. It's nice. I got word on Glabra from the from the uh, household Latin speaker. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It means, it means uh, what, what does it mean without hair? Can she just say hi to us? I think she's great. Come, come I mean, say it's hi. okay, no pressure, but she come can just tell hi. us herself. Come, if come she say wants. hi from your pajamas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Serena. Serena. What does it mean, Serena? Oh, it means with no hair, just smooth skinned. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> um, every so licorice is a is a is a patsy. It's a fall guy in the herb world, and um, every year around Halloween. Or this, they even did this again in like the beginning of COVID lockdowns nonsense. They, <laughs> there's always a story every year about some loser who eats too much, <laughs> too much uh, licorice and then gets uh, like, I'm talking like packs and packs and packs of candy and gets um, high blood pressure because licorice can cause high, like a large, large doses of licorice can increase your blood pressure, which is a medicinal action of it. If you have low blood pressure, uh, licorice is a great one for that. But, you know, it's always like the plant, the botanical, blah, blah, blah. No mention of like comorbidities or Halloween candy or any of that stuff. Um, or is somebody eating like tons and tons of, you know, packs of whatever. But it does have, because of that, there's always like the general like little caution thing that herbalists do that like, you know, well, if you have too much licorice, you got to make sure you don't have uh, high blood pressure. But I've administered licorice to people with high blood pressure before with that caveat because it's you, all you really need is just a tiny teensy dose and it has this system wide effect. That's why the Chinese love this plant because it has um, a really good way of marrying and combining other plants together in a formula and driving them down just like a mercurial plant would. Um, and so it's a good, it's a good um, activator, as they say in, in Sanskrit, dipana, which means like the, the thing that gets everything going, the chance. <laughs> Man, licorice candy just turned me off to the whole concept of licorice. So I need to come back around to it and give it a little more of a shot. I mean, I, I've had it in teas and stuff for sure, but uh, it makes me, the story you recounted just makes me think on, on the topic of mint, how when I was a kid, about sixth grade, I developed rosacea, like this rashiness on my face and had it for, they were giving me ointments and, you know, weird crap to put on my face St probably steroid based and wasn't really getting better. And I was just suffering from the side effects of whatever their pharmaceutical solution was. And nobody thought to ask me, what have I been eating? <laughs> and it turned out I had just been eating bags and bags of lifesaver winter green mints, those little white. <laughs> mints. <laughs> and I just cut those out and it all went away. <laughs> so <laughs> It's kind of a similar deal. Uh, I think that was probably more related to the artificial sweeteners than mint itself in terms of similarity to the licorice guy you just brought up. But yeah, the there, there's always these warning, warning, watch out for this, watch out for this, when really common sense will indicate nothing in excess and that should be enough to go on. I'm going to quote, totally. quote Mike Pompeo. 
It reminds you of the glory of the American experiment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one last thing about peppermint and licorice. If anyone uh, has ever been to like an Aveda, uh, the brand, the hair care brand, um, Aveda spa or like an Aveda hair cutting joint or whatever, their house tea is peppermint and licorice. And so for a handful of years, I used to go and get my haircut at the Aveda Institute, like the school, and they always have tea. They offer tea. And I would be like, what is this tea, man? And I finally asked and I'm like, oh, it's peppermint and licorice. And so anyway, just a little <laughs> tidbit. So if you ever go to Aveda and you have their tea, know that it's just peppermint and licorice. And it is really delicious. It always captivated me. But anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> Ooh, next we got Tulsi, a.k.a. Holy Basil. You so know, um... I have a little experience with Holy Basil back in the day. I don't know, probably before I started the podcast, I bet there was a time where I decided I'm going to get off coffee and I managed to have a pretty good run of no coffee. <laughs> and what helped was I started drinking this tea that was a combination of <laughs> sorry i'm just reading the chat started drinking this tea that was a combination of uh holy basil and guayusa tea and i don't really know what the effects of those things together were but it definitely had like a kind of like an enlivening effect on me that allowed me to replace the afternoon cup of coffee that was keeping me alive dragging through the office hours in the afternoon yeah I was laughing at Dylan's comment from uh, referring to what Gabriel just said. I don't think anyone <laughs> knew Gabe was quoting a CIA director. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Pompeo. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So there's a basil called Tulsi. This is amazing. Yeah. I, had, I had no idea. Uh, I, when I was texting Michelle and Mario that I, that I was going to put this one in, I said that I was, I was throwing a little, uh, fast meatball or slow pitch meatball for Gabe to knock out of the park with this one later, but oh my uh, goodness! <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about the plant, and maybe in light of what uh, what you were telling talking about here, Chance uh, Tulsi is the Sanskrit name. Also, word also another name for Tulsi is Tulasi, T U L A S I, um, and in the West we call it holy basil. In um, the Latin name is Ocumum Sanctum, Ocimum Sanctum, sorry, Ocimum Sanctum, as in the sanctified, the sanctuary. Um, and Ocimum is the same genus as your regular, you know, old garden variety pesto basil. So this is the holy one. Why is it so holy? Why is it so sacred? Yes, that's right, because it's an adaptogen. Um, there is a few plants that have, that have uh, this category of adaptogens, and most of them are very expensive. Holy basil is very affordable. So it's one of the best, <laughs> most used adaptogens. What's an adaptogen? It's, it's got a kind of a nebulous, nonspecific term that, um, that is a matter of academic debate in the herbal community. But basically, it brings up all systems of the body without depleting any. So it's, a, a, it's beneficial for the immune system. It's beneficial for the digestion. It's beneficial for the hormones. It's beneficial for respiration, so on and so on. And so that's why this plant has many, many uses. And that's why it would be a holy plant and um, a lot of, a lot of uh, traditions, in particular, um, the Ayurvedic tradition. Tulsi means the incomparable one. That's, the, that's what the word means. It's also the queen of herbs. Um, it's thought to be, this plant, um, an earthly incarnation of Lakshmi, who was the consort. <laughs> is the, Lakshmi was the consort of Vishnu. And so, you know, Vishnu, the mediator, uh, and she's the consort. So she has this protective quality, nurturing a goddess. Is this the same as Soma? Uh, no, this is not the same as Soma. Because there's, really knows in, what Soma is, but Soma I know there's lots be. of different versions of 
mythos, but uh, Castor and Pollux are, are also identified by Hindus occasionally as being Soma and Vishnu in kind of like an Adam and Eve pairing. Um, gosh, I can't talk believe Gemini. I, I, I can't believe I forgot about mentioning that Castor and Pollux was also the the twin sisters of Helen when we were on Helen of Troy. Um, oh, good. Oh, yeah. that, Helen, let me just push that back out. All right, cool. Anyway, um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, they're planted in these uh, in India. They're planted in these large cubic structures here that are uh, called Vrindava, Vrind, Vrindavans, Vrindavans, V-R-A, V-R, uh, Vrindavans. That's how they're called. Okay. Here's an interesting, um, so another member of the mint family, there's the rhythmic signatures of mints, is the mint uh, flowers. You see a lot of these flowers of the signature of rhythm, rhythm of the, of the heart regulates circulation, rhythm of the breath helps with respiration. Great plant for um, uh, binding up excess cortisol in the body, which is sometimes one of the reasons why when, when you have like an addictive behavior like caffeine, for example, um, this pattern of constant cortisol, I got to keep it, got to keep it up. And then the body recognizes that there's a lot of cortisol. So it sends more cortisol because it's this constant fight or flight feedback loop action going on. And so Tulsi interrupts that, it binds it up. And it lets you eliminate that. And so that, and then the other plant that you mentioned is high in B vitamins. So that, so that, that makes it a nice plant, a nice combination for eliminating that stress uh, mechanism that you would have with too much caffeine or the need for more caffeine to kind of power through the day, but also. Oh that yeah. Cause I like, that was a crutch for the, Oh my God, I'm back from lunch, but there's four more hours of working in this stupid office. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that would, it was definitely a stress re reducer. One of the things that's, uh, there's two, two fun scientific things that, um, this plant has studied that I I'll bring forward before I, uh, pass it on. One of them is that it's uh, really helpful also at reducing uh, excess positive ions in the body, in the body, and it helps charge negative ions. So it's got a, a lot of potential and, and is, more than other plants in that regard, just like waterfalls, just like sitting by the beach, just like sitting in the sun charges those negative ions in the body. Um, that's the stuff that makes you feel good. Right. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really cool is that this plant is helpful and has been studied in India for fluoride purification in water. Now in a lot of places in the world, they're like, what there's fluoride in this water. We got to get it out. And it's a different type of fluoride. It's fluoride from the groundwater. So we're talking about like on the, on the periodic ch table, fluoride. And the stuff that we in America, they're like, oh yeah, every, everywhere else in the world, they're, they're, they wanna address the fluoride in their water. They wanna make sure that everyone in the country has a high IQ and, and a good birth weight and whatnot. And here in America, we're like, dump it in, <laughs> just throw it in. And it's not just fluoride. It is sodium fluoride or sodium fluorosilicate, um, which is a byproduct of the aluminum industry. And anyway, Tulsi's, uh, the study of its effectiveness in removing fluoride is from these other countries. And I think that it, uh, I think that a lot of times when it's talked about as like a fluoride uh, antidote, it hasn't been properly studied in places like America where we're putting uh, sodium fluoride and sodium fluorosilicate. But um, in any case, if you put some, if you have some tap water and it's got some fluoride in it and you're not cool with that, then just throw some Tulsi in, throw a few leaves in. It's really easy plant to grow. It grows in your garden. It's a plant of good luck, of beneficiality. Um, it, in a lot of places in India, they have their pots with the, with the Tulsi in, in front of them. It's sacred to a lot of the deities there. There's this variety that I have on the screen is called Tulsi Rama. There's a blue variety called Tulsi Krishna. So the most sold variety is called Tulsi Rama. And that's the one that I primarily use. And I, this is one of my favorite botanicals. It's in so many of my preparations. And because it tastes good, it works great. And it's just got a multitude of possibilities and effects on the body. And um, I think therefore it ought to be a mutable air plant. So the sanctified basil, 
the the Tulsi. I can't wait to hear what Gabe says though. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I love this. I absolutely love it. I had no idea. Uh, so you know that Tulsi is essentially um, she is presaged by Wonder Woman. You know, uh, all, uh, and Wonder Woman has. And I can't, uh, it gets to the point Are where you're like, talking about Tulsi Gabbard, the politician. Tulsi Gabbard, yes. Yep. The, the, the character on the world stage is, um, I mean, it gets to the point where you're kind of like, which came first, the Tulsi Gabbard or the Wonder Woman? Like, I got to check her birthday and, you know, when, like, when Wonder Woman was written. Um, uh, but, like, the part where you mentioned that it is binding. You know, like Wonder Woman, she has the lasso, the lasso that she could put on people to force them to tell the truth. You know what I mean? And it has this, uh, this, uh, I guess that binding, that binding aspect comes to mind. What did you say the uh, literal uh, meaning of Tulsi is? Uh, the incomparable one. Incomparable one. Wow. What an <laughs> absolute trip. I'm loving this. <laughs> I am loving this. Um, so yeah, she. I didn't uh, realize she's straight up is Hindu. First Hindu member of Congress. Yes, yes, she is checking on so many obscure boxes. You know the fact that she's from Hawaii. Um, uh, the fact that she has that circumscript little thing in her hair, like a lot of like strange spiritualist nuance is just floating all around her but meanwhile with all of that like unspoken implication she's the freaking commander of psychological operations of the united states military i mean <laughs> it's crazy it's wow. crazy that they that's a heavy title man it well i shouldn't say the commander she reached up she was a commander and her point of specialty was psychological operations. Uh, yeah, it's like fascinating that such a human being exists. Um, but Born the as an Aries, I'm just looking at a Wikipedia page. She's an Aries son, so I guess. Yeah. <laughs> wow, so weird. It so is she so... was in the military. Okay. Yes. Ladies in the army. It's, it's something really fascinating. So uh, she was interviewed by uh, Peterson uh, about a month ago. I was like, oh, here we go. We're looking at her, you know, if maybe if not this round, because Dylan brought up a good point. By the way, I don't want to sidetrack too much, but Dylan brought up a mind boggling point. And that is that if Trump gets it one more time, then numerologically, he was president number nine. That's four plus five is nine. And he will be president number 11 if he gets it again. And so I don't want to derail, but eventually Tulsi's going to get it. What's he saying? <laughs> He's looking at it right now. <laughs> um, so she echoes Athena in just the most uh, fascinating way. But this is really something that uh, it also means the uncomparable one, uncomparable one. Um, oh, OK. OK. So then this week, um, Jordan Peterson interviews Kennedy Jr. And so we have had Tulsi and now we've had Kennedy Jr. on with uh, Peterson. And while Peterson was uh, interviewing him, I had a really strange, like, slick dissident epiphany. Uh, Chance, can you bring up the most recent graphic I sent into the uh, call-in telegram? I don't know how many people are, like, real serious nerds about Star Wars, but it just seems weird to have a Kennedy on in the word president in the same sentence again. You know, it, it just it feels like we're being set up for, to, like, rehash some, like, really, I don't know, potential traumatic language uh, from the lifetime of our elders. You know, 63, very sacred number. 
But uh, do you guys know who Saw Gerrera is from Star Wars? It's the Forrest Whitaker character. And that character in Star Wars, his voice is like, uh, it's like he's vax injured or something. He has some sort of a uh, wartime injury that he has a hard time speaking and he's actually out of breath all the time. And so Saw Gerrera is like a, an amazing match for uh, Kennedy Jr. here. And it's blowing my mind because Saw Gerrera is the leader of like a rebel, a rebel faction movement. Wow. And it's basically just the word gorilla, which is like a, a gorilla fighter. We would say gorilla, but in the Spanish, everything yeah. seems to come back to the Spanish stuff. Uh, gorilla. Basically. Guerrera. Right. And he's got this daughter. Can you zoom in on the name of his daughter? Or no, it's not his daughter. It's a, it's a, a niece or a, a sister or something. And her name is Stila, which is basically an anagram for Tulsi. T A L S E E. <laughs> Tulsi. T A L S E E. Or Tol Tulasi. Tulasi is the other name for Tulsi. Tulasi. There it is. There, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so the ca the character in Star Wars has this relative who has a name that is basically, I mean, and even Gabbard and Guerrera are so close together. It's crazy. But anybody who's a real Star Wars nerd will kind of be able to verify that this Saw Guerrera's voice is like, it's a struggle to listen to. It almost makes you run out of breath just to hear him talk. Well, Kennedy Jr. has the same thing going on where it's like exhausting to hear him be the voice of freedom. Well, it, that means that freedom is out of breath all the time. You know what I mean? It's really, it's a, fa it's a fascinating psychological uh, side effect. But I'll shut up now. Uh, I just wanted to put all this together because these are just recent thoughts I've had about Kennedy and Tulsi. And here's Tulsi on the, on the topic today. The Tulsi Mint of the government. It does govern the mind, Tulsi. It really does. It, it changes it in the case of how you behave and how you, how you can get along in your day. That's what Tulsi does. Right. In yeah. the T, oh, one more thing. T, T-E-A, used to mean taxed enough already. Was a, was an acronym for taxed enough already. So my whole weave about tea time and giving an homage or a tithing to the government, you know, uh, commu uh, communing with the collective. Uh, yeah, literally T-E-A -E meant taxed enough already. So here we have, this is a Tulsi charm very interesting <clears throat> yeah there is a few i mean there's many variations of this uh kyle this is a very fascinating weave <laughs> so i'm i'm intrigued for multiple reasons but i chose to put this one in the private chat because in this version the tulsi plant is within the bowl and then that's on this pedestal or altar four-sided by the way that seems to be a theme here that i've noticed between the various charms the four corners of earth the four cardinal directions etc and then it's the actually arc. on go ahead it's the it's definitely like the arc which is sure. uh you know a cube symbol as well and it's yeah. on the back of the turtle it's like this is the preser preservation of the world for sure absolutely so the turtle being the world turtle or a uh, world bearing turtle the cosmic turtle and so to me, when Kyle was talking about the incomparable one, I mean, I always think about the pole star, you know, that's the incomparable one in the heavens, because it's the only one that the heavens revolve around. And so to me, it just makes me wonder if that's kind of the implication or connection here. Totally. Great. Love it. Speaking of polar symbolism. <laughs> here we are sacred cedar here we go so uh uh me mario and kyle talked a bit about cedar when we were uh, at their house because uh we knew we were going to be speaking about cedar 
And so we had a little weave already before we're weaving right now on this tree. Um, and uh, this was the first, um, this was the first plant or tree, whatever you want to say, that came to my mind when I thought of Gemini um, for a couple of reasons. Um, but I think the, the, the pole symbolism, the mercurial uh, movement up and down a tree, up and down the pole, the tree of life, um, you know, which is the, the tree of life is the cedar in like the native tradition. Um, and so native Indians uh, would definitely consider this the tree of life because it was a medicine tree. It gave them, uh, you know, they made fibers from it. So they made clothing, they made tools, they made totem poles, they used it for shelter, they made it into canoes, you know, you name it, they kind of used it. They used all parts of the cedar. Um, and you can find lots of stuff on that um, throughout many books. And if you want to research it online too, but it's, uh, it's quite well known that the cedar was highly revered uh, by the native peoples and uh, still is today. And so we're looking at a, a red Western cedar this is the cedar that grows readily around our area, but there's many different types of cedars. Um, and so, and actually, you know, the cedar, the red Western cedar, um, it's actually, if I'm not mistaken, um, it's actually in the Cypress family. So it's not like a true cedar, but there are, uh, it's, it's relatable to this family. And um, even the leaf patterns and stuff like that kind of like translate over to other cedars. But um, in the natives of this region used it in the same way as they would any other cedar and revered it very highly. Um, I, just like a lot of the other pine trees, it's very high in vitamin C. So it can be used. It was used for scurvy. I know like back in the day, it was one of the main remedies that they would use for that. So there's also a connection to the lungs with this too, of just being very clearing and purifying. Um, it can be used to repel insects. And so you can actually take like the boughs of cedar and put them into your drawers. If you are wanting to maybe like keep moths away, there's certain ants that are repelled by cedar cockroaches as well. So maybe if you're having some kind of infestation of some kind, or you're noticing, uh, the, some of these insects that I just listed, you could actually probably employ cedar as an ally to kind of keep some of them away using maybe the essential oil, or if you have cedar near you, you could probably make up some kind of concoction. Um, and also um, cedar is sometimes used to repel ticks as well. So you could make yourself some kind of essential oil spray if you're in a region where ticks are an issue. It's not necessarily going to uh, not guarantee that you will not, won't get a tick on you, but it uh, could repel them to the point where they might smell you and they might uh, choose another host <laughs> if uh, you smell like cedar. I love cedar as a smudge. I love cedar using cedar, uh, particularly before you're going to have people in your space, or if you um, are a practitioner of some kind, um, I really find that it's wonderful. You could use it after as well, but there's something about, um, the element of the protection, I think that cedar brings that is really good to be using like before any kind of event is what I've found. One of the folk um, traditions with cedar is taking some of the leaves and um, you can use it for prosperity in the way where you can actually fold the leaves like into the bill folds of your wallet. If you're wanting to maybe attract money or you're wanting to work with the energy of money, which is very alchemical um, and, and, you know, commerce is very mercurial. So you're exchanging things back and forth. So it makes a lot of sense to me that you could use cedar um, in, in some sort of way if you're uh, looking for a monetary sort of boost or just to, you know, it's not always about, in my opinion, um, getting more money. I think because uh, in society in general, like in Normieville, we're not really taught how to work with money in an, in, in an intelligent way. And a lot of us are pushed into a scarcity mindset from an early age. And so uh, money becomes like an enemy or it's feared or something like that. So maybe if you were going through something like that in your life where you're wanting to build a better relationship with money instead of like repelling it or being afraid of it or thinking that it's the root of all evil um, and kind of like bridging the gap somehow, I think cedar could be very helpful to work with in, in that sort of way. 
And I think of just like the bright green, the evergreen money is green. At least our money is green, you know? And so, and then a lot of people will say, you know, they'll call, they'll refer to money as green. Um, and so this is just kind of like an interesting connection there. Um, and then a lot of times, um, specifically uh, in the native tribes, they would refer to the cedar, the, the red Western cedar specifically, they, they sometimes would call it mother. Um, the great mother. And so there's like a birth and a death connection with cedar. And I wanted to read just a little bit, if you guys don't mind, from this book. One of my favorite books of all time is Under the Witching Tree by Corinne Boyer. Um, I, I've talked about her before, uh, but she's just such a wonderful herbalist and um, magical practitioner. And so I, she has a, a really nice um, entry about Western Red Cedar. Western red cedar was used ceremonially for smudging, bathing, and medicine by many native tribes. The boughs and fawns were used to scour the body while bathing and preparing for vision quests, rituals, ceremony, and hunting. The tree was thought so powerful that it could even be leaned on by one in need to gain strength. The wood was used to make shamanic soul catchers for ceremony by the O Oquineo tribe, and it was thought that sleeping under red cedar would promote wild dreams by the Thompson tribe. The boughs were sometimes slept on to ward off bad spirits and to bring luck. The cedar bark was used for coming of age rituals for girls and also for protection of pregnant women. The Lumi tribe placed the afterbirth on a large cedar stump to assure, assure long life for the baby by way of magic. If they wanted the child to be a brave fighter, they would tie the afterbirth in the high cedar boughs. The bark was made into many types of ceremonial adornments by many tribes, often incorporating other elements such as trade beads, shells, or feathers. So I really liked that connection with the placenta and working with the afterbirth with cedar as this is sometimes known as the tree of life. And then here, this was one of the weaves that Kyle brought up when we were talking about it, but this is a cedar of Lebanon. And so um, Kyle can expand on this one because he had a really good weave with it. But this, when, you're, when you hear cedar talked about in the Bible, this is the cedar that you're looking at. And so it grows in the mountains. Um, and so he was talking about the reason why it grows the way it grows, where it grows out more wide um, than a typical cedar, like the cedar that you looked at in that first picture, super tall, especially the ones here on the West Coast. Like some of them are gigantic. And I find it interesting that these sprawl out uh, so much more. So, Kyle, if you wanted to jump in on this one, I know you had a few really yeah. cool things to say. When we were talking about it, we were, Mari and I were talking about, hopefully we can do a presentation on some uh, world tree symbolism, trees around the world, and cedar being a paramount example of that. Paramount, uh, there's a pun. Uh, but... Um, in the way that the eastern cedar, you, know, you were showing the western red cedar, but the eastern cedar, the former genus is Arbor Vitae. That means literally tree of life. And so, in the when you where you find cedars, you find a high reverence from them in the most deepest spiritual capacity by the native people or the people that are living in those areas in the west coast where you are, the Salish communities. They use the cedars as totem poles, which is basically a recreation of that central pillar access that you put on your ancestors, that you put on the, the pantheon and the deities um, that you gather around to worship. And, uh, and then other points of view of, uh, of these trees around the world would be places where you would find medicine, places that you would find um, uh, food, and also places that you can use for shelter. And so, of course, the cedars, you would have a great lumber, a lumber that doesn't rot, or lumber um, that, is, um, that is born in the, the wet environment. That's why you have cedar shingles and stuff like that. But in the, in the, biblical, um, in the biblical side here, here in Lebanon, like a lot of the, the conical trees, you know, in, in places where it snows a lot, they're, they're shaped as a as a cone, as to like sl slough off the snow, get off, get off of me. Okay, that way my branches don't break. But here in the mountains where it's very, ins uh, you know, it's not easy for 
things to live. And then it also snows up high in the mountains. These plants, these trees, they don't grow like that. They, they like almost stay <laughs> like nice and strong. And this is why they were regarded as um, Israeli people and whatnot as the most uh, formidable trees that there were. So somewhere in the Bible, I can't remember where, but they're talking, um, wh whoever that queen was that traded the um, sigils with King Solomon, who was building his um, twin pillar, uh, twin pillar um, temples. Uh, he was using some cedar of Lebanon in the construction. And in particular, there was a bridge that uh, this, this queen was crossing. What was her name? Um, Bash Bathsheba or something? Bathsheba? Anyway. Yeah. 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 And so she as she's crossing the bridge, she says, This bridge, this this these planks are going to be the demise of your people. And so he's like, Oh, I better throw it away. So he throws it away. And and um biblical historians and scholars and storytellers and the the those in the fable arts um talk about how sometime later and generations later. Um, after this tree fell into the lake and sunk down deep in the lake, when it was time to crucify the Messiah, bloop, it floated to the surface. And then uh, the, the centurions were like, ah, there's one. And so uh, when reading about the possibility of what the heck could a crucifix be made out of in the desert in Israel, what kind of trees would be supportive of that? It was the cedar of Lebanon. So this is the, the type of... Uh, again, symbol symbolic of the tree of life, the tree of death. There's your there's your cross again, um, and uh, so that's what I think is really interesting about this. We can go on and on about cedars, but we could stop there too. Yeah, I love this. I, I love the different shape of it, and I just look at the trunk on that baby. It's like so thick and strong. You know, it's yeah. really cool. And if uh, you go to the next slide, we did include a totem pole too. Just to, oh, well, the next one is the pine cone. Look at this. Okay, so this is the blue atlas cedar, and I could not. I had to include this into the slideshow because it's just mesmerizing looking at the cone of the cedar. Um, and different cedars have different shaped cones, but the one on the Atlas cedar is just so breathtaking to me. And I mean, you can't not think of the pineal gland, and so many people, so you know, know the pineal gland, pineal gland, however you want to say it, um, the connection to the pine cone in that and just the layers in this pine cone is so striking. And I would say like the Atlas cedar is one of my favorite scents. Like all each cedar has a different scent. You know, I work with a lot of different cedars and uh, the Atlas cedar is a favorite of mine. Um, and I just love how silvery blue it is. And it's, it's really gorgeous. But we also have a picture of a totem pole in here on the next slide as well. Unless somebody has a weave with pine cone, feel free. I always got to point out uh, the word cone in reverse is Enoch. Ah, -ha. <laughs> nice. There you go. There's a, there's the cedar of consciousness for you. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> I mean, I just want to point out the concentric nature of the pine cone as well. And yeah. so it just reminds me of sacred center symbolism and how things unfurl from the center to return back to it. Reminds me of, uh, you know, rippling water and things like that, which is very much, you know, from my perspective, uh, polar symbolism, essentially. And so is the totem pole. And so, um, you know, out of respect to um, this cultural dynamic, you know, I just have to say it's not something that I'm completely well versed in. I, I feel like it's just um, it's something that I will absolutely get around to. Chance actually gifted me a book about totem poles, and so I'm stoked to dive into it at some point. But you know, the polar symbolism to me is very obvious. Um, it's not uncommon for people, uh, different groups from around the world, to have had a family tree, world tree, tree of life sort of thing that they would congregate around. That was a spiritual connection between earth and the heavens that to me is like when you're talking about the tower or the tree the world tree it's basically a bridge to you know the other side it's a bridge to this other realm above us you know so in that way all things that are kind of phallic in nature whether it is the standing stone whether it's uh you know the tower of babel 
things like that, it's always um, symbolic of trying to bridge that gap between this domain and the next domain. And so to me, symbolically, you know, there's relevance there. But uh, my understanding, though, of totem poles is that encodes so much information, you know, mythology, um, family, lineage information, um, all, all sorts of different things that I feel like are incredibly significant and valuable and spiritual. Um, and so I just feel like it was worth bringing into the slideshow for that reason. And then Kyle, I was stoked to see that Kyle, when we were talking about world tree symbolism and stuff and the cedar that he brought up the totem pole. And so um, obviously there's many different variations of the animals and the uh, symbolism that you'll see, you know, within the totem pole and everything else. But that's pretty much just my general sort of uh, thing about it. But I would love to hear if you guys actually know more about it than, than myself. Maybe not on totem poles per se, but on cedar, there's, you know, bringing up like the whole biblical element of cedar having the spiritual significance and over in the Americas, it does as well. It's a protective, it's all about protection, right? You carry it around in your medicine bag as a, a protective amulet or sigil. And of course, when we're talking Lebanon, we are talking about Phoenicians as well at a certain point in history. This is their jumping off point from this part of the Middle East or the Orient to go through Middle Earth, the Mediterranean, and on the trade routes that seem to have connected the ancient world in amazing ways. So you have in, um, you know, prior to what I think that a lot of the Old Testament, <laughs> if not most of it, could be a derivation in some way from Mesopotamian lore. You know, even thinking about the Samaritan alphabet being basically the Samaritan alphabet being the Phoenician letters, and it was the holy alphabet of the Jews at one point as well before the modern Hebrew alphabet, although they have major similarities. The Samaritan is basically the same word as Sumerian. <laughs> and in of all literature, possibly supposedly the oldest great epic poem or great epic literature is the epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk. And Gilgamesh, without going into too much of his story, Cedar is a big part of his story. Um, and, you know, something that I thought of the other day is how Gilgamesh's alternative name is Bilgames, Bilgames, something like that. That's the Akkadian name. So Bill right there, switching it from Gil to Bill, and Sumerians would also apparently write it that way sometimes. Well, there's your Baal, or Bill, which is Lord, and Ham, or the G-A-M is like Ham, which is darkness, and then Esh is fire. So Gilgamesh is hiding the, the epithet of the Lord, uh, the dark lo Lord of the Dark Fire, or the Dark Lord of Fire, something like that. So this is like the winter sun symbolism which makes perfect sense because other epithets for him is that he's the king of the underworld and the judge of the dead, that that's where he wound up after his whole, you know, adventures in the Epic of Gilgamesh. But in the Epic of Gilgamesh, he goes to the great cedar forest described in the tablets as either being in the East or the West. But if it's in the West, then we're talking about the cedar forest of Lebanon. But either way, we're talking about cedar forests. He goes there with his buddy Enkidu, they have an adventure and slay Humbaba. <laughs> <laughs> Humbaba is like uh, the dark, evil spirit of the forest. Dylan, of course, is making uh, taking shots at it, not discovered till the 19th century. Hey, man, I'm with you on that. It's super <laughs> sus, but it, uh, you know, it supports the rest of them. It seems that to be whether it's older or newer forgery or not. It's part of the overall mythos that is the universal system. And so we have a Gemini thing with, with Enkidu and Gilgamesh that they are basically t brothers inseparable and mm -hmm. kind of the whole spiraling downward happens from the point for Gilgamesh when that leads him to his role in the underworld that from the point where Enkidu is cursed by Humbaba after Humbaba decapitates or I'm sorry, Gilgamesh decapitates the evil forest demigod monster thing, Humbaba. And so, so much interesting symbolism in it. Like Shamash, the sun, tells them it's time to go into the cedar forest and fight Humbaba because even though normally he wears seven layers of armor, 
Very important symbolism there. He's only happening to be wearing one layer whenever they ask Shamash if it's time. The, the sun god calls down to them and is like, yeah, go kick his ass. And then he gets, you know, Inkidu gets the curse and dies. But when the city of Uruk is built, it's built out of cedar, specifically the city walls, which is the protective layer. And, you know, then Gilgamesh goes on some other adventures, but that's a big part of his story is building the city and having this big, giant, you know, massive wall for protection made of cedar. So the mythology on cedar being a protective element goes runs really deep. Uh, absolutely. And maybe even having some uh, relationship to rulership as well. And I think that's probably part of the you know, prosperity and wealth element. The rulers are going to be the ones who help the land have prosperity and they're going to be the ones holding a lot of the wealth. So I'll leave it there. But, you know, I've been interested in uh, Gilgamesh stuff lately. So I thought I'd lay that all out since it seems appropriate. Damn. Hell yeah. That's funny. Ba uh, Baba Yaga's, she was on my radar this last week too. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Gabe. Oh, well, I just wanted to mention that uh, we got the anagram uh, creed in Cedar. Is that, uh, you know, C-R-E-A-D. Um, Cedar is so terrible or savior. Yeah, and you know that's kind of that kind of plays into a thought I'm having to also with it is like, you know, we we know the phrase birds of a feather, you know how you know certain people use certain animals as like their family totem. Well, there's also this they do the same thing with trees as well. You know, certain families use uh, um, the olive branch means peace. You know, extending an olive branch is a symbol of peace. Well, some families, the olive branch is their family lineage, you know. Uh, so that's something I think about, too, is that uh, certain trees are uh, symbolic of the family tree as well. Makes me wonder who has claim on the pine, on the cedar out there in the heraldry world. The Vatican. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> No, interesting connections here because, you know, going along with the protection um, and everything else, uh, Corinne, uh, in the book I was reading from, talks about how um, cedar is also known as like a community tree. So in it, it oftentimes cedars will grow in a circle. Like, you know, you'll find one and then you'll see that they kind of form a circle. And so protection, like the circle that brings in protection. And that goes back along with like that sacred center thing, too. And then you bringing up Baba Yaga. Um, there's also like a, there's a mother and a hag energy to cedar. And so like the darker energy of cedar, like you can always work with the light, you know, right. But on the opposite side, there's the hag, there's the forest hag that's there. And she's like a darker element. Um, and so I think that that kind of goes along with the birth and the death symbolism of this tree as well. And um, there's usually like a very, uh, there's like a welcoming sense that I get from cedar. And I have a specific cedar that I go to on my on my walks that I say hi to it every single time I walk past it. And I have a really strong connection with it. And I feel as though there is some sort of, um, there is an element of bringing protection in during a time of grieving as well with the cedar. And I think that that also goes along with the death element too, because obviously when there's death, there's usually grieving. And so it can actually kind of just like soothe some of that, um, that, that, that emotional stuff going on with, with the process of death and grieving. Kyle sent me this. Uh, is this a state flag of Maine? Yep. Yep. Wow, you got a cedar with a pole star right there. There you go. And a couple Ooh. of pillars. Just just to right. show you the masons were here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and even, wow, and the spice uh, that he has. Wow. Some Gemini no, symbolism. I, I never... The contrast so I, between it, the two figures. Yeah. Very interesting. And it says, what does this say? I don't know. There we go. I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. I found that the other day. Yeah, your wife research. knows. Yeah, she does. She's asleep though. But uh, yeah, I found that the other day in my research, and 
thought that was pretty cool. I'm sure the moose has something to do with it too. It means I arrange in Latin. Mm. Interesting. Or I lay straight. Wow. It's like it has to do with uh, arranging things in a military context, like getting everybody in their place. Right. I remember this from my territories research. This is uh, Maine is uh, Leo in my territories. So it's like Augustus, Maine. You know, the capital of Maine is Augusta. And it's the Maine oh, of the lion. Interesting. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, I, I lie straight. That makes me think so, of uh, in a placental uh, meditation. If you lay down underneath a tree and you're just laying down, you're of the earth, you know, and then you imagine your umbilical cord coming out, forming this tree, going up to the cosmic heavens and the, the branches from the tree that you're laying underneath kind of giving you that protection and having that little microcosmic reflection personally with that tree it's very beautiful i've had that meditation before so i'm lying straight on the ground that is and looking up into uh looking up into that placental uh just honoring that that twin you know in a, in a meditative state hallelujah brother excellent the, uh, i gotta show this on me. screen mario sent me this we won't linger on it but uh you know this is going in my notebook on my the notebook page I have on labyrinths <laughs> and labyrinth symbolism that he sent me this image of the terracotta mask of Humbaba, Whoa. the guardian of the cedar forest. And he Humbaba has the title God of the Fortress of Intestines. So oh, wow. possibly a proto minotaur type of situation, especially when it when you consider astro theologically, like the next thing that occurs in the story. I think the next thing that occurs is that they slay the bull of heaven because uh, Gilgamesh doesn't want to get it on with Ishtar. <laughs> so they got to they gotta go take out the bull of heaven. So there's probably for sure some master theology weave with that, but pretty cool. Thank you for that share. I'm definitely putting that in my notebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah you got it. That is cool. Yeah, I came across that... Uh a few years ago in one of my symbolism books and ever since then i can't think of the labyrinth without thinking thinking of the intestines and i can't think of our intestines without thinking about labyrinth maze symbolism <laughs> as well so it's just this thing that has kind of just once it was kind of seeded in my mind it's just always a connection um i think about but uh what i was going to say regarding the main thing it just is reminding me that one of the connections that is very interesting within Judaism regarding Gemini symbolism is the fact that Freemasonry being a Kabbalistic system, whatever its origins are, um, there's a lot of Gemini stuff going on there. As an example, um, they call each other brothers, you know, and this is uh, kind of an expression that very much relates to like Cain and Abel, um, but also the fact that, you know, the Gemini twins are brothers as well obviously um and so the uh the lover's card my understanding is that some early versions of the lover's card um it wasn't titled the lovers it was actually titled the brothers and i have at least one card where it's not actually showing lovers but it's showing brothers it's, it, it used to be a cain and abel representation you know and this is a whole entire deep weave within freemasonry and so the Gemini twins, those two pillars, obviously, uh, that's a huge, huge thing within uh, Freemasonic lore as well. Um, and then I was talking earlier about the brick connection with Gemini. Well, that's masonry, you know. So you're working with stone, you're working with bricks and all that kind of stuff. So the Freemasonic connection uh, with bricks is very much there. They use brick symbolism and metaphors and stuff like that in some of their degrees and, and everything else. So um, there's just a lot of overlapping stuff with that. Also, literally within the Freemasonic compass and square, you have G, you know, and I know there's multiple interpretations of what that G means, but um, it's interesting that Gemini starts with G as well, given all of these other sorts of connections, you know. 
good stuff man nice all right we're getting we're getting there guys this is uh going to be a fascinating finale on our herbal walk digital herb walk oh wow these cards feel awesome it's so cool how man when we get tapped in like this this is this is awesome okay <laughs> in this is hyssop another member of the mint family uh, with great virtues for the lungs. Okay, I'll get to that in a second. But I'm just, I'm like, oh yeah, we were just talking about the cedar. Now in the Passover feast, okay, as depicted right over here on the right side, you're eating a bitter herbs. That's what your, the, the plate is made of bitter herbs and uh, they're flavored with hyssop, which is a bitter aromatic mint. And do you know what that plate is called? C E or S E D A R Seder. That the the plant is or the, the plate is called the Seder. So so or cedar. So those uh Dylan brought up those philological connections before. I think that that really is interesting considering the Passover, um, not the feast of Passover, but like the the fasting portion of the fast of Passover before the uh, Passover feast. So here's hyssop. This is from my garden. Um, some mercurial signatures. Once, you, once again, purple, minty flower, blah, blah, blah. Same old, same old, same old. Not so, not like this abundant beauty when looking close, but when it's like, you know, in a, in a big old patch, it does look beautiful. The, the bees love this plant um, and bees are great little, mercurial icons too. I took away um, lemon balm, which is um, a bee plant, and I'll put that in next time. We'll talk about that so that we can ma match it up to the bee asterism in cancer. But but anyway, hyssop, sometimes pronounced aesop, um, and that comes from the, the Greek word hyssop refers to the, um, it just means like holy herb, again, holy, holy plant, of the Palestinians, in um, Ezad, I believe is the is the Jewish word, which also just means holy plant. And there's many many uh, passages in the Bible referring to hyssop. Um, Psalm fifty one: Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Um, so lots of times it's referring to this action of clearing and cleansing. And of course, this just like Ella campaign, as I was mentioning before, it's bitter it's, and it's aromatic. So it has this great expectorating quality. It's very, very nice for the lungs. And it's also a great digestive plant. And in many cases, just like Tulsi, it's just, it's a good plant for the kidneys. It's a good plant for breaking a fever. It's a good plant for the mind. Both cedar and hyssop, when combined in a bundle, in a smudge bundle, is like, it's fantastic incense. Um, so I'm an incense maker. I, I really, really, really like hyssop and I really like cedar too, the combination of them. That's biblical. It's old school. And um, so in the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, they were uh, they were given orders from above or whatever, the priest, whatever. They said, you got to dip your um, dip your lamb's blood with this hyssop brush here and put it on the post. And I went back to Mario and Michelle's interview with Jonathan Branch of Herbs of the Bible, which is an awesome two uh, interview, two part interview series. This is like eight hours of straight up gravy. So one one of those is on Michelle's channel, and the other is on Mario's. So highly recommend that. For about twenty minutes, they were talking about hyssop. They were talking about the door, the symbol of the door, and Hebrew alphabet as well. So, um, but one of the things that that uh, that they uh, they didn't get, but I, I remember, is that in the New Testament, the hyssop was the pole that was lifted up with vinegar and a sponge of vinegar to feed and quench the thirst of the Messiah being crucified on the pole. So it's like a mini pole wow. in reverence and, and honor, uh, but also there's like that sour aspect, you know, it's quenching the thirst with vinegar. Wow. Um, so that's pretty cool. And because of that, I don't know if that's just like a little fun little, sometimes when I read scriptures, I'm like, that is great medicine right there. Because when you take hyssop and you put it into vinegar, it tastes fantastic. It is like one of the best ways of working with this plant. Of course you can make, um, one of the things I really like to make is I like to, I like to distill plants. I have a really nice 
um, apparatus for that. I like to put plants in bundles and smoke them or say, smudge them, I like to burn them. This plant is a great tincture, but the fantastic um, qualities of this plant for the lungs come out in vinegar. I put it in my nail in my coffin <laughs> uh, cough syrup as because it is the one, I guess one of the greatest virtues of this plant is that it takes water out of the lungs and it moves it outwards to the periphery. So it's a good diaphoretic to, to dispel dampness and dry. And also it's a good one for a dry cough too. That's had that mucus baked in, but I just love that, uh, um, you know, Homer talks about this plant. This is just an old world, old school favorite. Um, back in Mediterranean. And it's kind of fallen out of favor in a lot of like the new herbal, a lot of herbalists don't really, there's not a lot about written about this plant anymore. Um, but it's, this is the, whenever you see the word um, officinalis in the binomial, the Latin name, that just means the, uh, the, the apothecarist choice. It means, yes, the official one, but it's referring specifically to the the group of people the officials uh that found this to be the most medicinal so there's a lot of different plants that have that um that species name and also there's the ophi which is the serpent as well right and um the he the healer not necessarily like ofi ofi but um the yeah there's a lot of things about that so yeah what else can i say what do you think michelle have you used this plant before you know, I haven't used it too much, but you know, when we did the interview with Joshua, I did did some research about it, and I was interested to find out that it was actually added. It was one of the plants that was in the original like recipes for absinthe, um, and I'm I'm assuming it's the you know the obviously the bittering um, that goes on with it, but um, some of the people were talking about how it offers a little bit of a mind altering. Um, aspect to the absinthe, um, which already has mind altering, you know, things going on, but the hyssop kind of just like puts another boost in. So I love that point though, about the, it being like a pillar, the pole, the, the um, plant that quenched the thirst with the vinegar. That's, that's some, that's gravy right there <laughs> for sure. I'm so glad yeah. you added that in. Definitely. No, that's fascinating. Um, which just reminds me too, by the way, the regarding the, the totem pole, um, that it, it's, you know, the totem pole or standing stone, uh, standing pillar. Um, one school of thought is that this very much predates the cross and that before mm. there were crosses, there were just poles or, or, you know, standing stones like that. But, um, Kyle, I was going to ask, is there something particularly absorbent about this plant or something? using it for blood and then using it for vinegar, et cetera, is, it seems like that's the association that's being drawn is that it's kind of like a sponge or something. Or it's a, not a absorbent. Perhaps. It's not absorbent, but it's, it's, uh, it's thin and it takes up a lot of space. So if you were going to use it as a, as a brush to kind of strew, strew things about, um, it would be very helpful. But the, the, um, the plant itself gets like a woody stem. So, in the, in the mint family, when plants get like woody stems, then you can, you can use it to hoist up. And so I'm not sure if he like stabbed the sponge or what it's actually talking about in this per particular instance of the New Testament. But, but I think it's really interesting, the detail, because they're, they're talking about using specifically hyssop. And then, of course, there's the cedar cross again. So we have the cedar cross. We have the hyssop uh, quenching the thirst. of, And then we also have hyssop being used in cedar ceremony for um, quenching your <laughs> your hunger, but but adding a little bit of that bitterness to it as well. So uh, as far as like utilitary wise, like um, it wouldn't, it, it doesn't have like absorbent properties as much as it's just like, it takes up a lot of space, kind of like, a, kind of like this, this plant here just would be, it would be easy to grab a whole bunch of stuff and strew it about. Um, that's the word strung it about. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the plant is, some people say it's stinky, like kind of skunky. Some people say it's lovely as a lovely aromatic. So it does have a polarity even in um, perfumery because of that too, mm. that baseness that it has. 
So I got a feeling we're like brushing up against a lot of uh, fascinating mystery. Like I love that you mentioned that this is almost a ingredient that has almost been forgotten, you know, that it's obscured and is almost fallen through the cracks of, uh, of detail uh, in, in certain culture. Um, because well, one thing that came to my mind right away was the word Mississippi um, and how the hyssop is kind of hiding out in the word Mississippi mm. um, in that it, in that this plant was integral to a ritualistic, you know, a cleansing, a ceremony of cleansing. Um, and uh, that's really cool that it was called the, the Holy Herb of Palestine. Uh, that's really like, yeah, there's, that's really obscure. Just, uh, just the, I think yesterday, Mexico acknowledged Palestine uh, like in the headlines, which is kind of a big deal uh, for a big country like Mexico to make an announcement like that. But um, but then one more thing that comes to mind is um, somebody mentioned it in the chat is Aesop's fables and how that uh, Aesop's fables were the last thing that Socrates did before he died. He was waiting for his uh, for the uh, for them to deliver the poison and while he was in prison his uh daemonic spirit kept telling him yo man you gotta you gotta try your hand at music like you pretty you pretty much did everything you came here to do but you never got down with music and he was like really you think that's it and his, his daemon is like yeah man like that's the one thing you didn't do so he spent his last days uh writing um children's limericks to uh based on aesop's fables and so even in that aspect, even that far back, uh, this word is kind of uh, an ingredient to the mystery of mysteries, I think. Dude, you just set me up so awesome. Okay, I have a hyssop jingle that I just forgot about until now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you couldn't do a whole stream without the jingle. And it's very childlike. All right, I have to get my guitar. I'll be right back. <laughs> that is awesome. That's so Are you guys awesome. aware Kyle was a touring musician? <laughs> I'm aware. Yeah, I'm aware. That's how he met his wife in Italy. Right, right. But I mean, I guess the uh, the chat might not be aware of this. Did he do a show for you guys? He didn't. He no. should have. <laughs> yeah, I guess we should have asked for one. Maybe next time. <laughs> he did show us uh, his vinyl records, though, which is pretty cool. Like the artwork and stuff on it. Nice. Yeah. I'm very interested in maybe some more finding out some more mythos on hyssop. I just seem to only be able to, in a preliminary search, find that it's culturally a purifying agent in various parts of the world, pre Bible even. Yep, Homer wrote about it. Um, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you all about it in this jingle here. <laughs> I encode the medicinal actions and some of the, the mythos as well. I'm throwing a hissy fit and I ain't gonna stop. I'm sweating like Odysseus when he met the Cyclop. In the old, old world, when you're coughing up a slop, they say, do the Medusa hiss. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. What was your band's name, Kyle? <laughs> oh boy! Um, <laughs> like, I don't know. No, my my, my band. Oh, my band. My my good band. That uh, yeah, my good band. The Midwest Beat. That was the band. That was the band that uh, toured and we went on the world stage and in smaller parts of the world stage, I guess. But dude, that, that was beautiful. That was absolutely beautiful. I love it. <laughs> thanks yeah i love i love just little i know i know 15 second uh attention span whatever it's not good for you but i like little little things you know just little little th cut to the point get to the chorus all right next song 
<laughs> nice. This was a great weave. Holy Ooh. crap. It's yeah. been awesome, guys. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been really good time always is and i want to also promo Ooh. how uh, michelle you were just on over sharing podcast oh yeah i was yeah mm -hmm. good call that was and that's a good from one. the brandon Thanks, bonanza fellas. youtube channel so i know it's a different name of but just look Ooh. up you know uh, michelle <laughs> brandon bonanza or michelle over sharing probably should find it i'll i'll make sure and drop a link to it in the live chat here and I bring it up because, you know, it's great to hear Michelle on the interviewee side, but also I'm, they're premiering an episode with me on Thursday. So both of nice. us have a recent appearance there and it was a really good co conversation. I had a lot of energy. I was just like super fired up in the flow state and I kind of like, I combined information from vibrant number 58 where i went in on the nag hammadi creation story and uh gnosticism and then i combined that with uh, some of the talk about the therapeutic that we did the other day and so sort of brought those threads together and it's a really good conversation about like what is gnosticism what's the origin of it and yeah good times so check nice. out that it's going to be tomorrow night if you want another stream to hang out with us on and other than that, I don't think I have any uh, other promo stuff I wanted to cover off. So I want to make sure you guys all got a shot at it. Um, check out the latest Crow episode. No, the one before the latest Crow. I was uh, they, I was back on that one doing an interview. I talked a little bit about the Doctrine of Signatures, talked about some of my fun successes with busting the nonsense in the sky, talking about some world trees as well. Oh yeah, did you use hyssop with your boiling vinegar? <laughs> I haven't used it yet, but uh, <laughs> but I might since it's got such like a, a strong sacrificial quality to it, and it's like you know, the and it's about purification. You're like brushing you, you know? the sky with hyssop to uh, purify it. That could yeah. be cool. It is. It's really interesting. The, to me, so that whole thing, the angel of death. Um, did I say the, the, the fellow's name wrong? Is it Jonathan or Joshua Branch? Jo oh, oh, he's Joshua. Joshua. Okay, yeah, Joshua. Yeah, sorry if I, missed, if I said that wrong earlier. Uh, in the connection with uh, spiritual entities, particularly like angels, as if they were like programmed to have uh, like one, one uh, kryptonite in them. Like um, they, they'll come and kill everything, but they can't stay on the side of blood that was dipped in hyssop ah! uh, or whatever. And, um, and so I'm really interested in playing around with, I don't know, um, inviting the, the beneficial aspects of nature and intention um, in a cosmological and greater work, because I am a community herbalist after all, and it is my, um, my great joy and pleasure to uh, do, to make medicine for my community, even if it's just the little umbrella underneath, you know, my my little local sphere here. So that was fun. That was a really fun conversation. And uh, yeah, and I'm also, I just love, love, love this group. And it was great to talk to Michelle and Mario at home here. And we just hit it off like old friends that had never met in person before. And it was so fun. And um, and uh, thank you so much, Chance, for having having me back and having us back again. And it's been awesome. So thank you. Oh, you know, I I, th I want to add on to the hyssop weave a little bit. Oh, okay. I thought <laughs> Something we just came to mind. You know, Sorry. <laughs> there's, okay. So to be clear, there's two instances of hyssop in the Bible, right? No, there's more. There's, there's, more. there's, okay, there's uh, two there's major some numbers. Ones. There's some in Exodus. There's the Psalm. There's Crucifixion the and the Passover story are the two I'm thinking of, right? There's even the Psalms. There's yeah. There's there's many. But there's more. There's way more. I would okay. So I would be curious maybe for somebody to uh, look up the other references to hyssop and see if we could maybe narrow down where the uh, where this is at astro theologically, right? Because for for one, uh, I think hyssop had. Well, did we know the Greek name for it or like the, you know, where that word comes from? It's the Greek word is hyssop and um, hyssopis. And 
It, it's literally referring to the the um, the name that the Israelis called it, which was E Z A B Ezab. Um, I'm, and so I have to, I would have to look at the the um, Hebrew name of it in Hebrew, but um, it it looks like Hisop. It's like Ezab or Esop. Okay. That's good to know. I think that there's probably a phon phonetically a relation to the Hebrew word for goat that Dylan put into the chat earlier. That's Gaza. Um, uh -huh. I'm sorry. That's uh, O-Z-A. That's Alev, Zayin, and um, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> I can't read, make up the last character, but it's O-Z-A in uh, Aramaic. I'm sorry. And that's, you know, similar to where Azazel comes from. That's what he's saying in this comment. Well, goat, Gaza, Capricorn, and then Oza, this, and Azazel. And the story here, we're seeing that the hyssop is being used when the angel of death is appearing, right? Like Jesus is about to die. And then in the other story, the major story of the Passover, the angel of death is visiting in Egypt and you got to do the hyssop brush to prevent it from taking people or taking the firstborn son, firstborn son. <laughs> so we're seeing a lot of the same elements story here that there's a death. You know, we're probably looking at the Capricorn season astro theologically is probably where hyssop is actually somewhere up there sky clock wise, or maybe it's like a play on words for this uh, OZA word pertaining us to Azazel and goats and Capricorn and yeah. Gaza, which is e Egypt, <laughs> you know, all of these. And Egypt is like even winter in the astro theologically speaking. So my point being, we're seeing thematic links. We can also demonstrate, or at least we have in the past on, on shows, it's maybe too much to go into in a proving it way, but we've talked about Bacchus and Jesus as many connections and that they're essentially the same being. They're this, savior soter <laughs> satyr being and that you know mercury ruling gemini he's got satyr attributes all that goes together and this was a, a cool little tidbit that i just recently you know re came across again and realized oh yeah that's i need to put that in my pocket that the arabic name for bacchus is misus or misus m-i-s-e-s -E which is the consonant consonant wise it's an exact match to moses and moses is a word referring to an initiate or a savior in the hebrew so my point being you know moses raising up the brazen serpent is jesus on the cross they're the same archetype and because it's from the same storybook it's the astro theological storybook and this hyssop is a good little clue to that i think because you see these thematic links of like death the the death of a son uh you know <laughs> firstborn son versus the son of god dying it's not the same story but it's like they take in my opinion these myths are all so expansive because you're just taking sort of the same uh symbols and alphabet and characters out of this one text which is the sky and telling a new story with the same parts and then telling a new story with the same parts and we just see it over and over again and so i think this is a good the hyssop's appearance is a pretty good clue to all that i wanted to maybe tack that on to the end <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm looking in the comments and it looks like Dylan mentioned one way to spell it looks a lot like the Azov Battalion, mm. which, uh, which is a very, that's a very significant word right now. Very right. fascinating that we're discussing its ritualistic significance. And here it is as a keystone in the, in the, in the battlefield as well. Mm. I would maybe watch out for news regarding them having somewhere in the proximity of uh christmas or capricorn season where the sun dies on the cross type of thing because that that's the sun in winter is when the sun dies on the cross the sun in winter is the angel of death right as all you know like i feel like i don't know if i got enough details in here to really make the case as it all seems to like fit together <laughs> but there's definitely a there there i when i was studying hyssop that I got that hit too. And uh, that's, I was like, huh, that's, it does seem very uh, close to the Azad battalion, but um, so yeah, that's pretty cool confirmation in my, in my mind. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Be interesting if, uh, 
we see a doorway or a threshold smeared with them. <laughs> yeah, because this plant has a lot to do with the sacrificial quality, right? And it's like it has a lot to do with the sacrificial quality. So here we have a, a, a almost a, like a, a scapegoat that's been put up this whole time, you know, um, yeah, for, for the slaughter. <laughs> Uh, uh, it brings a uh, eight eight comes to mind. The Lion's Gate definitely comes to mind. The, uh, that's also related to Mercury, eighty eight right. eighty eight days, right? For right, one complete cycle. Yeah. Sometimes wow. Well, <laughs> I just looked up the their patches of the battalion, and there's a uh, three crosses. Basically, <laughs> is the symbol. <laughs> Just like December 25th, the Jesus and the two thieves, three crosses being present. Yeah, so there's something there. And, you know, the last question I have about it, Kyle, would be, could you potentially see some qualities in hyssop that might actually give it a Capricornian placement as well if we were doing some signatures? Because you mentioned that the, uh, oh. the stock gets very, like, bony and hard, right? That could be it one thing. It gets woody. Yeah, it gets woody for sure. Um let me think about it. It's not like it's not poisonous. It's purple. A lot of a lot of purple uh, signatures is mercury, but it al also is. Um, it's a little bit. So this is like a the minty purple right here. This is a type of mint, the cat cat mint. It's called. The hyssop gets more like the Saturnian purple. So I'd say that's uh, there's a little crossover signatures too. Yeah, and also it lasts into the winter. Like I was I was seeing blooms in December last year. So that's another. Saturnian signature of the plant. Very cool. Okay. I can see why it might've got put there in the sky clock then, especially as a purification thing, because that's sort of what the sun and winter is about. It's the destroyer that is also the regenerator. So purification is all about in a Gemini sense. Like we talked about with the swords, it's about crucifying something from yourself or from the situation as in removing it, you know, for things to be pure or you know, for clean, you got to remove the dirt <laughs> for purity in heart or behavior. You might have to remove some kind of behavior, um, remove some kind of corruption. Right. And that's what essentially the sun does in winter is it's it uh, removes most things, removes about everything, but the corruption as well. <laughs> so and death in general, you know, that's what death serves that purpose in nature. So, uh, yeah, I think hyssop could definitely fit in the end of the end of the solar cycle part of the sky clock very interesting yeah and dylan says just so you know azov is just north of the black sea which black winter am darkness yeah so there's uh that's another fun thing that someday we should just find a way to go deep on is how geography has astro theology to it because it definitely does. So the place names, astrotheology and place names is a, a big untapped market for an aspiring researcher to demonstrate the system. Uh, you know, it's definitely there. 100%, dude. That would be a fascinating conversation or presentation. Um, yeah. Yeah. So should I just give my credits <laughs> or uh, shout outs <laughs> or whatever? Um, Please. Because there's, I, there's a few threads that I can continue pulling at, but I think we're good. We're over. I mean, hours. I'm having fun, but if everyone wants to wind down, I feel like it's over three hours at this point. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Awesome. I just got a second um, win, though. For sure. I, I kind of feel the same way, to be honest. But uh, just want to thank everybody who's here right now. You guys, uh, love you guys. This is uh, always fun. I have a good time. I always learn a lot. Um, and I want to thank to the audience as well for hanging in there with me because I haven't been feeling well the last few days. If people couldn't tell, uh, I feel like you all perked me up though. And so I actually feel much better now than I did at the beginning of the show, which, uh, was when I was really feeling it, to be honest. Um, but as far as stuff that is like coming you around, sure you the don't corner, want to pull at least one of the threads that's, you know, noodling up there <laughs> in your, uh, uh Baba labyrinth brain intestines. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh I'll I'll share this one because I think it's intriguing. Um so you brought up the biofield earlier, right? And um I don't know if there's a particular shape you imagine or uh visualize with the biofield. Definitely would, with Taurus. Right? Which is egg-like, I would say, arguably as well, right? 
And so I think it's really interesting that the um, the egg is associated with Gemini twin symbolism. There's a number of hero twins that are said to be born from a cosmic egg. And so um, it's not uncommon to see, as an example, Mercury kind of wearing, Mercury Hermes wearing like a, uh, a, a little cap, right? And uh, I've heard that it's symbolic of an egg shell and that that's where it kind of comes from or whatever. Kind of reminds me of the Amica as well. Is this actually alluding to some sort of egg-like shell concept or whatever? Even the shape of our heads, very, very egg-like. And um, I was really, really uh, pleasantly surprised to learn several months ago that uh, there is this idea, and I understand there's a lot of baggage that comes from the Theosophical Society and Blavatsky and things like that, but the idea of different um, races, root races and whatever. But when you look into this whole entire system, the original race, uh, I believe they called Polarians, and the idea was that it, only your uh, bio field or your auric field or whatever existed. And so you had yet to manifest. And Chance, you've talked about this, I think, with um, Topher before. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Could be. Yeah, I think what you're talking about fits the description of Seraphim as flaming, flying serpents. Because if you strip the body then and you're just dealing with the, the bio field, it will still have this pole shape, which is like a serpent. You know, your chakras, if you just remove the physical, but you still have the energy body, there would definitely be like a central column of light and then like a, a dimmer light as you went further away from the core column center of that energy field, of that life exactly. force field. And so that right. would look like a flaming serpent because flame gives off heat and has like a, you know, a dimming effect the further out it gets from the center of where that light source is. And that's basically, yeah, that describes a, a, a human energy field with no physical body describes seraphim perfectly. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, you got it. And so to me, it just reminds me of this idea of these hero twins being born of an egg to me, what it's just describing is what we're talking about right here is the idea that, you know, within the egg itself, within this shape, within uh, this uh, energetic body, you have this column, which when you're talking about the column, you're talking about a pole as in polarity, as in positive, negative, up, down, as above, so below sort of stuff. So I think that's kind of one of the uh, symbolic threads that relates to all of the things that we're talking about, essentially, is that when you're talking about the Gemini twins, you're talking about the nature of polarity through and through like you know uh, as above so below so it's not just twins and relationships and this and that or whatever you're talking about the nature of the pole itself and the nature of the pole has this really interesting correspondence with the egg or the torus field as well so just wanted to throw that out there because you had brought it up and i made a, a quick note about it um but as far as what I have going on right now, so you brought up over Sharon. I'm actually talking to them on Monday, so I'll be over Sharon <laughs> on Monday. Uh, All right. And then We're taking over over Sharon. Woo! Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I don't think it's live or anything like that, but that'll be coming out at some point pretty soon. And then uh, I reckon on my probably end, the next Thursday. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then on my end, I've been talking about the tunnels of set, the clipothic tree, um the 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 root side the night side of the tree of life and there's a guy that i've been i've looked into his work for the last couple of years now his name is gb marion and he's actually a practicing setian and so that is his whole jam and so he's part of a coven they're all setians and he puts out a lot of uh work related to this mythology and symbolism and everything else related to the northern sky and and you know the pole star and this great mother typhon and all of that and so i'm going to be interviewing him uh on sunday which will be coming out probably yeah. later on that week so it's going to be pre-recorded and i'll just say too not that it i would interview him regardless but one of the things that i find really appealing about him is that he's actually a positive setian and yeah. so he takes all of this symbolism and he has a very very I, I f feel like a, a more holistic spin on it versus some of the other material that I've been reading about related to it. But his understanding of the symbolism is really, really deep. And there's not many people who kind of go there, um, who you can listen to their podcast, talk about some of this stuff. So I'm really excited to talk to him. So that'll be on Symbolic Studies here pretty soon. 
That is going to be a banger, Mario. Dude. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm looking forward well, to it. So, I mean, he's on his, he's on a whole nother level, but you know, he might, I don't know if you saw, but I discovered, um, that Socrates is in cancer. He is the Socrates in reverse is set articles and, uh, set like the donkey headed Egyptian deity set the donkey is in cancer. Okay. It, this makes me think of the boat of Ra being guarded by set and the boat being Arga. Argos, which is in, so set Ar Arga or something for Socrates. That's Arga. Argo. Yes. Yes. All of these things are in cancer, but specifically Mario, the scene, uh, the, the painting where, uh, Socrates is reaching for the cup and he's about to drink the hemlock, right? That last moment. Anatomically, that entire painting is, uh, is cosmologically, uh, on point. Each character is a constellation and Socrates is, uh, cancer. And he's pointing to the sky while he's reaching for the cup. Um, so your your Setian friends may be very interested and probably have a lot to confirm with the idea that Set is in the constellation of Cancer, and that uh, Socrates is enacting the spirit of the as king. He's always as king, so he's constantly as king questions. And Set, of course, is the ass. What did I miss? Did I miss a comment? No, dude. Uh, just in the comments, uh, um, someone mentioned Juan, and then he immediately chatted. Did someone summon me? And apparently, if you <laughs> type homunculus into a live chat, Juan from the one on one podcast just appears. <laughs> what the fuck? What's up, Juan? Nice. Uh, slick. Howdy, Juan. That's really interesting because, um, you know, one of the things, right, all you have to do is look into Royal Arch Freemasonry, and you're going right. to see that the. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm totally losing it. Uh, not the capstone. Keystone. Keystone, Keystone, thank you. The Keystone generally has, or sometimes has, the Cancer Glyph right in there because it's symbolic of Cancer. It's at the top of the arch, which means yes. that symbolically it's at the top of the dome, which means symbolically it's in the northern sky. And that's basically everything I've been getting into regarding Set, is that he has a strong, strong, strong connection with the northern sky. Um, yeah, which I think is really fascinating and with Sirius as well. I have this whole new appreciation regarding Sirius symbolism that I'm kind of dying to unpack because it gets really, really, really deep. Um, so yeah, we're going to get into hopefully all that stuff. And, you know, one thing that I learned from you, Mario, is how cancer is like a it's the most uh, faded of all the constellations. It's like kind of hiding or it's almost like you have to work to find it. It makes you like exert your vision to to discern its shape, you know. So I think there's something kind of cool about how Set is like an occulted character is hidden or veiled uh, so much so often, and how the Cancer constellation itself is hard to see, you know. Right, right. The other quick connection regarding Set and Cancer is that um, Set is associated with Sirius and the rising of Sirius is the beginning of Leo. And so just the relationship between Cancer and Leo, there's a Setian sort of correspondence with that as well. Nice. The, man, the heliacal nice. uh, rising of Sirius. So there's a lot to get into with that, but good stuff. Man. Cool. I, and I just Googled the uh, Socrates painting that you're referring to, and I've seen it before, but I'm kind of seeing it with new eyes now. Yeah. If uh, so, uh, it was a couple of, a couple, a couple slick dissident videos back. I did a kind of a, a walk through, uh, through the constellations, through the characters in the painting. Uh, and yeah, Socrates is totally the set Arcos. Uh, I, I got a couple things popping up pretty soon. Uh, over on the King of Cups, you'll probably see us do our uh, nostalgia spell episode. That's going to come out here in the upcoming days. So I'm excited for that. And uh, that's about all I got going. Uh, you'll see me over on the Rising from the Ashes uh, from time to time also. So that's my jam. Great, guys. All nice. right. What a fun night. Definitely. 
<laughs> very mutable energy throughout this experience as well. So uh, interesting times. Jim and I is fun. <laughs> And we'll be returning to go deep into cancer, the waters of feeling. <laughs> so cool beans, guys. Make sure you're following everyone here in all the various places that you can. Check the show notes for their main links. And I guess other than that, we'll see you all on the next Vibrant or Interverse on Sunday. Good night, everybody. Much love. Later. Ciao. Thank you, guys. Peace, everybody. <laughs>